Number 10, Iska loses in victory. I love this defeat because it happens in the form of a victory, which is pretty weird and pretty great. This takes place when Iska is challenged by the Fisher King to a battle of loss. In essence, challenging Iska to see who has felt and experienced the most loss. In this way, the Fisher King kind of sneakily defeats Iska by making her step down from a direct battle after feeling the weight of all she has lost as a result of her powers. And the weird thing is, technically she wins the fight because she feels more loss, but in doing so she kind of loses in the way that the Fisher King wanted her to. Well, Iska's mutant power is to never lose. Challenging her in this way basically ensures she will win. So having to feel and reflect on all the pain she has suffered and caused. As such, this causes Iska to leave Arako, planet Arako, unable to carry on, at least momentarily, in her fight against her fellow mutants and causing her to step down from her place on the Great Ring. Which many people feel she no longer deserved as someone who so deeply betrayed Arako during their fight against Uranus. Even if it was, you know, her own powers that compelled her to do so. And you know, Iska's obviously done that before a few times. They were like, we're kind of over this. <laughs> Especially when Iska just walks in and is like, well, I'm back. Uh, I'm also helping you guys run this, right? I, I can't deny that I would also be like, Iska, get out of here. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love devastating defeats, whoo, you will love our Invincible playlist because Invincible is full of devastating defeats, <laughs> devastating brutal ones. So go check that out. Number 9 Karma comes for Alexander Luther. Alexander Luther is the one who pretty much set in motion the events of Infinite Crisis, a major mastermind behind it all. In the end, it only makes sense that from a hero standpoint, he would have to face, you know, some kind of justice, because that's how these stories typically go. And while initially he seems to escape pretty unscathed, at the very end of Infinite Crisis issue number seven, we see him come face to face with Karma in the form of other villains, Lex Luthor and Joker of the main continuity. While Xander seems to already kind of be in the process of putting together his next plan, he is accosted in an alley by the two villains and quickly defeated, with Lex asking him as he slowly bleeds out on the pavement, now who's stupid? I'm gonna spoil it for you, it was Alex, Alexander Luther, he's a stupid one I think is what Lex is getting at. It's like it's not me because now you're dead, so. Number 8, Batman versus thugs. Have you ever played the Batman Arkham games? The combat in those games is absolutely fantastic, but it still leaves me wondering how many of these random street thugs actually survive after their interaction with Batman, because I doubt it. He hits hard, and he is pretty unforgiving about it. Which serves his whole point of instilling fear, sure, but I think because these nameless thugs are cannon fodder, they essentially get the worst beatings of most of Batman's villains, and we never hear from most of them again. So that tells you all you need to know. As an example, let's talk about a group of thugs in the All-Star Batman and Robin series issue number 7. Now this comic is written by Frank Miller, who seems to be able to get away with making Batman do pretty much anything I guess, like there's no rules with Frank Miller. Like in the opening pages of the issue, Batman comes speeding into a group of armed thugs, foot first, maniacally laughing like the Joker, and talking in his head about how Gotham is full of cockroaches. He relishes in the fact that the criminals are so scared that they are disposing of each other accidentally, and then he sets fire to a bottle of bleach and tosses it into the criminals, blanketing them in fire, and then continuously beating the snot out of them while they're on fire. And then what happens next? You'll never guess because Black Canary pops up out of nowhere and these two superheroes just start making out and getting busy while the thugs are literally barbecuing in the background. Unfortunately, yes, this is Batman, but not my Batman. Mm -mm. Number 7, Superman and the Manchester Black Beatdown. What's so funny about truth, justice, and the American way? I don't know. But what I do know is that the Superman story that uses that question as its title, also known as Action Comics issue number 775 for any of you who want to know, is awesome. Essentially, this comic sees the arrival of a group of heroes called the Elite that fight crime but in an incredibly bombastic and brutal way with no regard for lives lost. This flies directly in the face of the moralities of heroes like Superman and Batman, but apparently not. The leader of this band of villainous heroes goes by the name Manchester Black and he has an incredible level of telekinesis, able to punch a hole in a mountain with a simple thought. He is incredibly capable and so are his 
team, fixing problems before Superman can even get to the scene. Now, eventually, Superman, attempting to stop them from operating using such brutal forms of justice, gets his butt handed back to him during one of their first altercations. But that was Superman with the gloves on. As fast as a speeding bullet, Superman takes down the other three members of the elite, leaving only Manchester Black left. Now, in a move colder than I've ever seen before, Superman subtly uses his heat vision through Manchester's eye and cuts the connection between Chester and his telekinetic powers. Essentially, he lobotomized Chester using his heat vision, taking the ability to use his powers at least until the JLA could arrive and he left the elite in an unconscious dogpile. Number 6 Magneto Beating Apocalypse Magneto and Apocalypse are two incredibly powerful mutant villains with frighteningly similar goals, and yet we never really fully see them teaming up. But we also rarely ever see them fight either, except in the Age of Apocalypse reality. In this world, the mutant Legion had gone back in time in an attempt to bring an end to Magneto, but he inadvertently caused the passing of Xavier, his father, which led to a world where Magneto forms and leads the X-Men, and Apocalypse has nearly taken over the whole world. This all came to a head in X-Men Omega. Now, on paper, while Magneto is powerful with a capital P, when compared to Apocalypse, he should be a walk in the park for the second mutant to ever exist, and their fight going going on simultaneous with about 3 or 4 other little skirmishes is intense. It's full of great lines, crazy twists and turns, but the best part is right near the end. Apocalypse has Magneto on the ropes and he gloats in his own glory wondering why the master of magnetism isn't fighting back. Now staring straight into Apocalypse's eyes, Magneto says, I can't, I'm concentrating. And then they both look down to see Magneto's hands at his abdomen as he completely rips Apocalypse in two straight down the middle in the most awesome looking panel I have ever seen. It's so good. Number 5 Invincible. Invincible, Mark Grayson, is an incredibly strong character. Being a Vilchermite, Invincible is a member of one of the most unbeatable species in the galaxy. Mark is also a young adult, who hasn't learned how to control himself or his powers completely. So, it's interesting that one of his greatest enemies is an incredibly squishy man by the name of Angstrom Levy. That's because Angstrom is pretty intelligent and ruthless, but also because he has the ability to open portals to alternate realities. Using his knowledge of of other dimensions, he was able to figure out the alter ego of Invincible and find out where Mark lives. He travels to Mark's home and then captures Mark's mom and brother. First of all, making things this personal never works out for a villain, so they need to stop doing that. But Angstrom does actually put Mark through a good old fight, using portals to send the hero to multiple different dimensions, which was really cool, honestly. Where Levy made a big mistake though was when Mark's mom, Debbie, decides to try and attack the villain using a lamp, smashing it over Levy's big old head. Levy didn't take too kindly to this little affront and he broke Debbie's arm. Now in a fit of absolute blinding rage after seeing this, Mark charges full force at Levy and they end up crashing through multiple realities until they land in a sandy desert wasteland. Which is when this idiotic guy Levy decides to threaten Mark's family again. Invincible, still in this blind rage, uses all the strength he has, completely pummeling Levy until Mark looks like he's covered in ketchup and angst is now a huge puddle, but somehow he still comes back. Number 4 Conquest Yes, we're still talking about Invincible. For the Viltrumites of this Invincible comic series, they have extremely high resistance to damage, but what makes them even more capable is that when they do get beat down, usually by another Viltrumite, and they survive the damage, once they heal up, they become even stronger than they were before. It's why the oldest Viltrumites are usually the most powerful of the bunch. Now one old timer Viltrumite goes by the name of Conquest, and he is one great grizzled old man. Battle scarred as hell with a cybernetic arm and psychotic as hell as well, he arrives on Earth to check on Mark's progress with taking over the planet. That's a whole long story, we don't need to get into it. Essentially, he arrives after Mark had just gone through some sh**. I can't say that. So Mark is not in the best mood, but Conquest does not care, and these two have an absolute slog of a battle over the course of four issues of the comic. It's Insane. Conquest takes a few hits, sure, but Mark is no match for this guy in the slightest. In an attempt to help Invincible, his girl, Adam Eve, decides to show up on the battlefield and lend a hand. And she was far out of her league, but she's very powerful. Didn't really matter. Conquest punched a hole right through her. This was the line that you just don't cross. It sends Mark into a frenzy. 
The two Superman like beings fly straight at one another, and Mark punches straight through Conquest's cybernetic arm, breaking his own arm in the process. He uses his unbroken hand to clock the old man in the face. He bites a massive chunk out of the guy's shoulder. Adam Eve revives herself out of nowhere, lends a helpful blast, and then when Conquest breaks Mark's other hand, this guy uses his head and headbutts Conquest over and over and over again. It was like 15 hits until what was once his head is now a stomped on can of crushed tomatoes. I don't know if we can even show this one, but it's just insane. Number three, Squirrel Girl versus Doctor Doom. Look, we're talking comic books here, okay? Just Keep that in mind. In Marvel Superheroes number 8 from 1992, in one corner, we've got the full, untested, unbridled powerhouse of Squirrel Girl. And then, in the other corner, we have the Fantastic Four's top enemy, the ruler of Latveria, the man who has wielded the power of the Beyonder, constantly blends incredible technology with powerful magic and artifacts, fueled by his massive, deserved ego. It's the one and only Dr. Victor Von Doom. Who's the winner? Obviously, it's Squirrel Girl, what the hell? Summoning a monstrous horde of squirrels that completely swarm Doom as he cries out, My much vaunted technology decimated by these gnawing rodents. And he escapes through a trap door, diving into a river and leaving behind his mask, which Squirrel Girl takes as a trophy. Of all the defeats on this list, this one is definitely brutal. Completely tore that man's pride straight from him and sent him running and screaming with a whole cacophony of squirrels. Damn. That was kind of fun. <clears throat> Number two, Mr. Dumpo. I know, I'm surprised that Punisher has not shown up on this list too, until now. Honestly, I can tell you why. The Punisher doesn't really have that many memorable villains because his whole thing is that he doesn't let them live. Usually his villains are gone from existence by the end of the issue and definitely before the end of the series. And usually he does it very quickly and very easily, but definitely not always. In the Punisher volume five, number 11, the Punisher is facing off against a guy called the Russian who was hired by another bigger bad who we talk about just, just in a moment. When the two finally come face to face, the fight sees them tumble through Frank's apartment building, crashing into the apartment of Frank's neighbor, Mr. Dumpo. Mr. Dumpo is not the smallest man. In, in fact, I'd say he's quite large. Yeah, that's how I'd put it. Using a fresh out of the oven, scolding hot slice of pizza belonging to Mr. Dumpo, Frank burns the Russian's face, and then Frank then takes Mr. Dumpo and tosses him on top of the Russian and dog piles on top suffocating the Russian to his demise. Could you imagine going out like that? Just take a moment and think about it. That would be horrible. Number one, Ma Nyochi. That's how I'm gonna say it. I said we were about to talk about another Punisher villain, and I wasn't lying. Ma Nyochi, or Nyochi, or however you, tell me how you pronounce that in the comments below, just, I can't figure it out. She's the head of the Nyochi crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Now, before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian at the last point. Now in the Punisher volume five, number 12, after taking down about 80, yes, eight zero of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She put up a decent fight with no limbs though, sort of, after she attempted to gnaw his ankles off, unsurprisingly unsuccessfully. Frank uses his big old foot, plus the muscles in his leg, and not so gently places this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Cold. Or hot, actually, cause fire. Coming in at number 10 is Batman versus Prometheus. This may be one of the silliest, yet coldest Batman takedowns I have ever seen. In fact, down in the comments, I want you guys to let me know your favorite absolutely wacky Batman takedowns. But for now, let me explain this one. The first time Prometheus encounters the Justice League, and specifically Batman, he overcomes them all, just showing how much of a force to be reckoned with that he is. As for how he brought down Batman in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the villain does what all villains do and gloats about how he did it. Using his helmet, he is able to program the skills of the 30 greatest martial arts masters in the world, including Batman himself, into his body and brain for his own use. Not one to be outdone like that though. When the time comes for the rematch, Batman 
cheats and forces Prometheus into using an older version of his helmet, but this version had been tampered with by Batman so that instead of the 30 greatest martial artists, Prometheus now has access to the physical abilities and skills of none other than Professor Stephen Hawking. Now Batman could very easily punch the lights out of Prometheus who is stuck with muscular neuron disease that renders him a drooling catatonic. God, it's it's almost offensive, but it's just so good and such a Batman thing to do, like out thinking his opponent like that. Mm. Ah. Number 9. Magneto versus the Red Skull Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II, and we all know Red Skull and Hydra stance in World War II Germany. So, it's safe to say that these two villains will almost never get along. Right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually temporarily united. But it's really important to note that Magneto was unsure whether this was THE Red Skull that aided Germany in the slaughter of his people. So Magneto confronted him and the Red Skull confirmed that he was indeed the original, which was a mistake. It didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the skull. But unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape hatch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food and no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. And in at number 8 is Deadpool vs Bullseye. Reading through issue 11 of the 2008 volume of Deadpool just made me remember why I love Deadpool. Not that I forgot or anything, but man. He's just nuts, which makes it so good when the foe he faces is almost just as bonkers as he is. This time, it's Hawkeye, but not actually Hawkeye. It's actually Bullseye dressed as Hawkeye because this is happening during Dark Rain. And that's a long story on its own, which maybe we should do an attempt to explain of that at some point. For now though, Bullseye slash Hawkeye has been contracted to take down Deadpool. In the last issue, he managed to get an arrow right through Mr. Pool's noggin. So in this issue, Issue, Deadpool takes it out and his brain is still half regenerated as he tries to take on Bullseye at this meat farm. Now listening to his half formed brain, Deadpool takes cover into a meat locker and decides his best course of action is to quote, be the meat. And he suits up in a butchered pig using it as makeshift armor. Wade charges Mr. I, who had conveniently run out of arrows, lands a good crack, rack, and a crock and then takes a swift kick to the no man's land. The fight transitions to the kitchen where Bulls Hawkeye, or whatever you want to call him, comes at Wade with a buzzsaw and Deadpool, wielding two meat hooks, trips, grips, and sends a hook straight through this fellow mercenary's chest. The dynamic between these two psychos is just a treat to read, but I'd honestly recommend just reading the whole of this volume of Deadpool itself. It's fantastic. Number 7. Storm and Emma Frost A bit of a lesser known rivalry between two comic book characters is the one between Aurora Munro, Storm of the X-Men, and Emma Frost, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Now, Back in the day, Emma was a villain more than anything else, and during Uncanny X-Men 151 and 151, the White Queen ambushed Storm, using her telepathic powers to swap their bodies, and then enacted a plan for the Hellfire Club to attack the X Mansion. Now, After a whole lot of kerfuffle involving Kitty Pride, Emma lost control of Storm's powers, and that gave Storm the opportunity to swap their minds back. Storm gets the tempest caused by Frost under control, then saves the White Queen from a massive fall, all heroic-like, but being the villain, Emma tries yet again to attack Miss Monroe prompting Storm to straight up smack Emma with a massive bolt of lightning. She flies up into the air, raging like the goddess she is, then flies back down, grabs Frost by the throat, and scares the hell out of her by almost taking her life before Wolverine, of all people, talks her back to morality. It's fantastic. I love Emma Frost, but I think because of this, I love Storm a little bit more. Number 6. Kingpin vs Grey Hulk The Hulk is an interesting character. He's gone through many changes over time, even having different identities than just his regular green savage smashy smash one. One of his first, when he was still a Grey Hulk, would be Joe Fixit. Joe Fixit is a persona of the Hulk who is a relatively intelligent Las Vegas mob enforcer. It's great! Well this year, in 2023, he got his own series. Fixit is specifically the enforcer for the Berengeti crime family, 
and in the series, Mr. Berengeti's operation becomes the focus of a certain Wilson Fisk, aka the Kingpin of Crime, who is planning to strong arm a takeover. Problem is, you can't really strong arm anything when one of the people you're facing off against is the Incredible Hulk. The best part about Joe Fixit is the fact that no one seems to be able to work out that he is just another version of the Hulk, so he is constantly underestimated. Within the first few moments of Kingpin's meeting with Mr. Berengeti, the plan he had goes south very quickly, and he decides to smash the man's desk, which is when Mr. Fixit enters the fray. Fisk's goon is slapped aside like a piece of unwanted salami, and then Fisk, who has gone toe to toe with Spider Man, who, as we know from part one of this list, is usually holding back, comes bull charging at Fixit, who obviously tanks three blows without flinching before grabbing Wilson's fist, hoisting the massive villain over his head, and then throwing him through the floor into the casino, and then picking him up and slamming him down into the floor again, and then holding his arm hostage until Fisk says that the meeting is over in English, then French, then Pig Latin. Priceless. And at number five is Batman versus the Hyper Clan. This point is eerily similar to the Manchester Black versus Superman point on part two of Brutal Villain Defeats. In 1997's JLA, helmed by Grant Morrison, a team of superheroes shows up on Earth and begins fixing problems and completely eradicating supervillains, gaining popularity with the people that rivals the Justice League. The difference here is that this team of superheroes are actually white Martians. Unsurprisingly, the first of the Justice League to find this out was Batman himself, who managed to evade being captured unlike the rest of the League. Sneaking into the Hyper Clan's base, he managed to lure one of their members, a mortal, who he strung up with a little Batarang held sign that read, I know your secret. When three other members of the Hyper Clan showed up, Batman brought them down with a single match and a circle of gasoline, turning their one weakness to fire into his greatest ally because he's Batman. Number four. Darkseid. Darkseid is not a character you mess with. He is incredibly powerful with an insanely capable mind and the ability to practically never pass away. Sure, we could talk about his defeat at the hands of Batman, but that's kind of boring. Batman's a regular guy, sure, but he's also Batman. What we want to talk about is volume 3, issue number 2 and 3 of this comic called Superpowers. This comic was made to go along with a toy line, so we already should slightly suspend our knowledge of what various heroes and villains are actually capable of for right now. Now, in the story, Darkseid's Omega effect had been dwindled to almost nothing thanks to Mr. Miracle, Tear, and Mr. Freeze. After being betrayed by his people, he winds up teleporting to Earth with the last of his energy. Now, covered in a cloak, Darkseid is forced to to rob a store just to find more clothes and remain unnoticed. But just after he does so, Darkseid is confronted by a pair of muggers in an alleyway. A pair of regular old human muggers who bully him, threaten him, and then knock him out cold with a chain just to rifle through his pockets and run off into the night. But the best part is how he looks up with a big Darkseid frown and goes, Oh, surely my plight can sink no lower. You never see Darkseid like this. And certainly Certainly not in a fedora and a trench coat. Mwah. Number three, Starro versus the Justice League. Despite how ridiculous the idea of a massive starfish looking alien that can control minds is, Starro the Conqueror is still one of the Justice League's earliest and most dangerous foes. All the way back in the Brave and the Bold issue 28 from 1960 is our first ever introduction to Starro. Now, this was before he used starfish face huggers to control minds and instead would use a telepathic beam to control huge scores of people. When Starro did this to a town of people using one of his deputies, the Flash happened to take note of the fact that one kid, Snapper Carr, who was possibly the most annoying kid to grace the pages of comics, was immune to the effects of Starro's mental control. But it was a mystery as to why. It turns out that Snapper was covered in calcium oxide, aka lime, from when he was working on a lawn earlier in the day. Lime, used by oystermen to fight starfish off of their oysters, also happens to block the powers of Starro, curiously enough, and so Greenland grabs a bunch of barrels of the stuff from a nearby farm, and the Flash grabs bags and bags of it from a chemical warehouse, and they team up to proceed to absolutely cover Starro in lime, imprisoning the Conqueror in an unbreakable shell of lime. As it sets in the comics, a living statue of lime. Number two, Firestorm versus Parasite. Rudolph Jones found himself exposed to a strange form of radiation, which changed him into a bald, green-skinned parasite with the ability to absorb the life energy 
of others. Well, in Firestorm the Nuclear Man issue number 86, Parasite is released from an area he is being held in and goes on a rampage, draining multiple people of their life energy, including Firehawk, who fell pretty easily to this villain. Now, Luckily, the hero Firestorm is nearby. At this point in time, Firestorm has become the world's fire elemental and received a pretty significant power boost. Almost as if to prove this, Firestorm comes in hot on Parasite with a blast of flame and then, when Parasite tries to drain Firestorm's power, the hero is completely unaffected as he says, quote, My powers come not from myself, but from the earth. I don't have power, I am power. And in a last ditch effort, Parasite decides to try and trade energy blasts with Firestorm. Now, unfortunately for Parasite, it is nowhere near an equal fight. He uses up all of the energy he took from Firestorm, and then just trying to hold back Firestorm's blast, Parasite goes through his own reserved life energy until he is on the brink. Realizing he will lose, he begs Firestorm to stop, saying that Firestorm would bring the end for Parasite, to which Firestorm simply says, that was my intention. Luckily for him, Parasite was saved by the allies of Firestorm who told him to stop, but this hero left Parasite emaciated from using up his own energy. And finally, and at number one, is Joker versus the Red Skull. Now look, the Joker is a maniac, an absolutely insane criminal lunatic, but hey, he is an American criminal lunatic, goddamn. Which means dealing with someone with the past of the Red Skull is an absolute no-no. Yes, these two villains teamed up together in the Batman and Captain America team-up special, back when DC and Marvel actually got along with each other. Naturally, these heroes' two greatest villains team up to take them on, but I guess it turns out that even Joker is above the morals of a World War II era war criminal. The Red Skull hires the Joker to steal an atomic doomsday device, which the Clown Prince of Crime totally agrees to do, until he sees Red Skull waltz out with a certain symbol front and center on his outfit, indicating his involvement in WW2, which is then confidently confirmed by the Red Skull. This is when the Joker delivers the line about being an American criminal lunatic, and the two simultaneously attack each other, Joker with his venom and the Red Skull with his quote, dust of death, which they are both immune to. This is when Joker gets smacked over the back of the head with a wrench, but eventually the fight makes it onto a plane where the Joker overpowers Red Skull and they both go tumbling down through the sky alongside the atomic device they stole, destroying them both in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now I don't know if I'm more shocked at Joker's switching of sides, or the fact that they had a fist fight while straddling the top of an active fat boy. It could be either, I don't know. In at 10, The Joker. Mad Love is one of the most beloved episodes of Batman the Animated Series, but the story of the episode was first told in the show's tie-in comic, The Batman Adventures. The story provides an in-depth look into Harley Quinn's origins, and the full extent of her relationship with the Joker. After her anniversary plans end up being thrown out the window by Mr. J, she decides there's only one way to win her Puddin's affection, capture and kill Batman. And she succeeds, but the Joker isn't happy. If anyone's going to take Batman down, it's going to be him. And so he lashes out at Harley once again, leaving him alone with the Dark Knight. The two fight, but Batman's able to use Harley's successful scheme to his advantage, taunting the Joker that she came closer than he ever actually has to killing him, and concluding the jab by calling him Puddin, which is one of the funniest things I think Batman has ever done because, you know, he's usually like a brooding and dark hero who refuses to kill despite all of his darkness, but I mean, like, come on. He called his greatest enemy by his girlfriend's pet name, and that's probably one of the best Batman moments ever, but it's still a stupid way to beat him, if we're all being honest. In at 9, Ultron vs Thanos. Ultron vs Thanos is an idea that we've been asking as comic fans for a while. However, this question was actually answered thanks to the Disney Plus series What If. In the 8th episode of Season 1, we gotta see what would have happened to the MC you if Ultron had won and gotten into the Vision's body. If the heroes had failed to steal it and put Jarvis's code inside, Ultron would have wiped out everything, apparently, using the Mind Stone and his vibranium body to decimate everything and everyone, until only he remained. However, it was certainly easier to do this after Thanos showed up with the other five Infinity Stones. We expected a climactic and epic battle, but instead, what we got was honestly pretty realistic. Ultron as Vision simply says fascinating and then uses his Mind Stone to slice Thanos in half, resulting in him collecting all the Infinity Stones at once, and then just ruining everything else. Showing us that the worst mistake in the MCU was killing Vision before Thanos showed up. Number 8, The Marquis of Death. 
In 2009's Fantastic Four number 566, Dr. Victor Von Doom reveals to us and his people that he had learned almost everything he knows from one incredibly powerful reality warping villain called the Marquis of Death. With his master now on his way to see how Dr. Doom had fared as ruler over the Earth, only when the Marquis shows up with his mysterious new apprentice, he was less than happy with the progress Doom had made on Earth, and to punish his old apprentice, he attacks. The Marquis completely warped reality, making Doom think he had actually won the fight, and then snatched the victory away, set him on fire, turned his heart to stone and his blood to acid, and then sent him back in time to the Pliocene Age to be eaten by megalodons. Do you realize how insane that sentence is on its own? That should be the point right there. But over the course of the rest of the story, the Marquis goes on to fight the Fantastic Four, almost beating them. But he is brought to a point of nearly being beaten. Which is when, out of nowhere, his apprentice, the new one, shows up and slaps and destroys this reality warping villain. But not before revealing that he is actually Doctor Doom himself. Apparently, Doctor Doom survived being eaten by megalodons and being turned to stone and his blood to acid, gained enough power and dark magic to completely change his form, became the Marquis' new apprentice, even defeating Uatu the Watcher so he wouldn't be discovered, and he did all of that to hide in plain sight to get his revenge and finally defeat the Marquis of Death. If you guys are enjoying this list so far, make sure you check out the rest of the channel for parts 1 to 3 and maybe subscribe while you're there so you don't miss part 5 and all the rest of our comic book loving content. Thank you. Number 7. You'll only be remembered as a madman. Professor X really cannot catch a break. In almost every universe he is in, he dies at some point and usually pretty terribly. And in the case of the Ultimate Universe, he died by having his neck snapped by Magneto during Ultimate. Ultimatum. But hey, at least he got an on panel death. Very few were quite so lucky during Ultimatum. Though it does feel weird to call being defeated lucky, but. Here we are. Xavier's famous last words to Magneto are warning him that he has gone too far, and that regardless of what he thinks he can do, wipe out the entire world as though he were a god, wash the human race from its surface, that he will not win, and in fact will go down in history as another madman. Just another madman. When Xavier compares him to the leader of Germany during World War II, however, the Chancellor of the German Reich, you know who I'm talking about, that causes Magneto to snap, which makes sense given Magneto's history. He snapped Xavier's neck in response, so while Magneto would not ultimately win the greater war here, he would win this battle at least. Pretty permanently, because you know. Xavier's dead. Number 6. What a lucky man I was. I think the wild thing here is how little is said or thought in this fight. Well, I mean, there are no thought bubbles. I'm sure people are thinking, but we don't get to know what they are because, you know, this defeat comes from the battle between Superman and Doomsday, but in the animated film, The Death of Superman. So yeah, no thought bubbles here. The fight here between Superman and Doomsday somehow comes across as even more brutal and devastating to me than in the comics. Superman is choked by his own cape at one point, which Doomsday rips in the process, and when Superman is ready to give up, it is Doomsday's direct threat to Lois Lane, who tosses a rock at the brute in the midst of the fight, brave Lois Lane, that inspires Superman to get up one last time. Lois shares that she got Clark's note, and she confesses that she shares his feelings and actually loves him back. Not willing to see the woman he loves die, Superman takes one final swing at Doomsday and manages to break his neck, twisting his head all the way around, killing him. However, this final punch also seals Superman's fate, using his last bit of strength before he too perishes. In the comments on part 1, someone actually talked about how Superman's death here while fighting and defeating Doomsday in any of the versions of this story could be seen as a victory, because he did accomplish what he set out to do. And while I agree with that sentiment, because yeah, Superman does defeat Doomsday, Doomsday also robs Metropolis and the world of one of its most powerful heroes during this fight. And so in that way, Superman is kind of also defeated. I mean, he loses his life. So it's kind of like a two-way defeat when you think about it. It's bittersweet. Which to me sums up what a brutal defeat is. It's something that is often hard to watch and something that comes with usually a pretty high cost. Number 5. Yeah, I always get up. Man, when it comes to tragic Spider-Man deaths, for a guy that seems to always survive just about anything, we sure have a lot of those. And into the Spider-Verse, there are multiple Spider-Men and women, Spider-Folks as I like to say. In the reality of Miles Morales, he is Spider-Man, but even in his reality, there was a Peter Parker who was the original 
original Spider-Man. Tragically, almost as soon as Miles gets to know him and he sees that Miles also has spider-like abilities, he's gone. Leaving Miles without a mentor until he meets the alternate reality, Peter B. Parker. Peter dies while trying to stop Kingpin's plot to open up portals to other dimensions, in the hopes of reviving the family that he lost. After passing on a USB key, or a goober, as it is called by Peter B., to Miles to use it to stop the collider, Kingpin and Prowler confront Spider Man. And when Peter warns Kingpin that his plan will both destroy the world and ultimately fail in the process, or I mean, at least destroy New York here, Kingpin loses his cool, slamming his fists into an already exhausted Spider-Man's chest, killing him. Number 4. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it does me. Famous words that come from Joker before he brutally attacks Jason Todd with a crowbar. This all went down in the Batman story A Death in the Family. Fans at the time were able to vote on whether or not Jason Todd would live or die. After the brutal attack on his life in issue 427 that ends with an explosion going off which buries Jason's body in rubble, in issue number 428 Eight, we'd get our answer to that fateful question. And ultimately, it would be established that Jason had, in fact, died. Although much later on we learned this wasn't quite true when he seemingly returned from the dead years later as the antagonistic anti-hero Red Hood. Number 3. You losing your cool Brucey? This is probably one of the most brutal in terms of the devastation that was physically wrought here. For this point we're talking about Wolverine versus Hulk but in the ultimate universe. And you know it's going to be brutal because it's the ultimate universe. Wolverine was tasked with hunting down Hulk for fury but when he finally does find Hulk, Hulk remarks on how he really Really doesn't want to be found. Also proving that, you know, he doesn't really need to be disturbed because he's actually calm, he's intelligent now, and at that time of no danger really to anyone. At least not in that moment. So long as they don't, of course, goad him into getting angry, of course, which you guessed it, Wolverine purposefully does here. In response, Hulk and Wolverine begin to fight and eventually Hulk rips Wolverine in half. And once Wolverine manages to climb a mountain to recover his legs, his lower half of his body, Hulk then threatens to eat one of Logan's legs. Ultimate universe, why why you like this? Fortunately, this pretty brutal defeat of Wolverine is interrupted by She-Hulk, who in this universe is actually Betty Ross. Number 2. What's 17 more years? While Think Mark became one of the most famous and memeable lines from this superhero defeat an animated series I would say in general, one of the most brutal moments in this fight happens when Omni-Man suggests that he could basically just destroy Mark, literally kill him with his own hands, and you know, just make another child if he has to. Asking rhetorically, what 17 more years? For him as a Viltrumite, his lifespan is of course much longer than a human, so to him 17 years is basically nothing, a very short span of time. However, reducing his emotional connection that has been built up with his son over 17 years to something so seemingly meaningless as though none of it really meant anything makes the beating that Mark takes here just even more brutal. Granted in the greater scheme of things, we know it isn't this simple for Omni-Man who, it is revealed, does love his son and is unable to actually swing the killing blow probably because of that. So. Number 1. It was a nice piece of work Kingpin, you shouldn't have signed it. It doesn't get more awful than this defeat right here. This one happened as a greater part of the famous Daredevil story Born Again. In issue number 227 of Daredevil, we are told the story titled appropriately, Apocalypse. And indeed, if you are Matt Murdock, it would certainly feel like the apocalypse. Here Kingpin finds out Daredevil's secret identity and uses it not to simply kill him, but instead to destroy his entire life. First he comes for his law practice, making it seem as though Matt bribed a witness in a case. But he doesn't stop there, he comes after his finances, his sanity, and even blows up his apartment and in the process destroys his costume. However, while DD is left feeling pretty defeated by you know, that point of the whole thing when his apartment goes boom at the end of this issue, he at least now has a name to pin this all on. Seeing it all as the work of none other than Kingpin. So that's a plus, I would say. At least he has like a vendetta now to keep him going. But coming in at number 10 is Jack Frost. When Jimmy Olsen was on a game show back in the Silver Age series Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number 33, a special prism appeared randomly in a garbage dump that for some reason, turned the thoughts of the game show contestants into reality. Just go with it, it's a comic book, okay? So, when Jimmy answered a game show question with Jack Frost, that's exactly who appeared. Jack Frost, as a villain, threatened to plunge the world into a new ice age. Now I'm sure that's not at all what Jimmy had in mind, but luckily, he is Superman's pal. So, what was Superman's solution? 
Simple. He would just go fly into space and move the frickin' sun closer to the Earth. Not only is this an absolutely ridiculous feat, which is theoretically completely impossible, but it was incredibly embarrassing looking for Jack Frost, who had to run away from Superman, who was essentially chasing the freezing villain with the sun. Once Jack Frost had retreated into a deep, cold cave, Superman put the sun back where he got it so it didn't destroy the Earth. The bonkers part about this is that he did all this nonchalantly as if he was moving furniture. It's it. Number 9, Hank Henshaw. After Superman's infamous death at the hands of Doomsday and his not exactly surprising return to life, Superman had to clean up the messes made in his absence, including some imposter Superman. One of which would be the cyborg Superman, Hank Henshaw, that took over the role of Superman in his place. This cyborg wasn't really doing a great job with his supermanning, and I think most would agree that he was really tarnishing the name of Superman. Because he was. Hank ruined Soup's memorial, and more importantly, he had just blown up Coast City, taking the life of millions of people. Now, when Superman actually returns from the dead, he doesn't have his powers back just yet, so the conflict actually lasts a little while. But once Superman gets his powers back, you best believe he beats this sucker, and in one page, no less. Hank is a cyborg, like I said, so Superman ends this guy by simply punching him straight through the chest and then using his super speed to shank him so fast his screws come loose and he just straight up falls apart. Superman shook this sucker to death. Coming in at number 8, it's my smile. The ongoing story behind Birds of Prey issue number 124 doesn't really matter too much, but basically the Joker has figured out where Barbara Gordon, aka Oracle, is based at, and he shows up with all the bravado you'd expect, trying to take her off the board, relying on their previous interactions to keep her afraid and mistake prone. He goes stalking through the halls of the clock tower, but Babs, she ain't afraid. She reveals herself and the Joker goes for his attack, throwing a knife which she intercepts, catching it on one of her billy clubs. What she can't block are the bullets he then sends flying her way. But dodging bullets seems to be one of her many skills. Trying to get a better shot, he comes even closer, bringing him within her striking range, allowing her to disable his trusty blam blam. He gets one good smack on her before Oracle uses her other club to hit him in the mouth so hard her club actually cracks. But that wasn't the only thing that cracked. Babs had hit the Joker so hard that she broke almost all of his teeth and knocked out a good chunk of them as well, destroying one of the things that the Joker prizes most. His smile. Number seven, Alpha Flight number 12. When the villainous Jerome Jackson discovered that his old employee who had ruined his life, James Hudson, was now a superhero leading Canada's super team Alpha Flight, he vowed revenge and sold Hudson's identity to the evil Roxxon Corporation, who gave him the resources to form the villain team Omega Flight, whose only purpose was to kill Hudson. They set a trap for James, tricking him into moving to New York for a job and then attacking him. Jackson attacked Guardian using the box robot, but Guardian managed to use his suit's power supply to overload the robot, killing Jackson. However, this caused Guardian's suit to overload and blow up, setting him on fire right in front of his wife, Heather. This was obviously deeply traumatic for Heather and the team, and they actually disbanded for a time as a result of this loss. Even when Hudson returned to life a few years later, things were never really the same for him, with his relationship to his wife being consistently strained as a result of his untimely death. So, this is a superhero defeat that has defined the character's entire life going forward, coloring it with an inescapable misery. Number six, the death of Gwen Stacy. For a lot of his early run as the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn had no memories of his criminal activities, due to the Goblin being a separate personality. Green Goblin tangled with Spider-Man several times over the years, with Goblin eventually swearing to bring misery and pain into Spider-Man's life life as revenge for always stopping his schemes. He eventually was able to follow Spidey and watch him change in an alley, discovering that he was really Peter Parker. Osborn eventually became aware of his goblin side and embraced it, and concocted a scheme to ruin Spider-Man's life. It's not actually a particularly complicated scheme when you think about it. In Amazing Spider-Man number 121, the Green Goblin kidnapped Peter's girlfriend Gwen Stacy and then threw her off of a bridge. Spider-Man managed to snag her with a web, but the whiplash caused by her sudden stop caused her to break her neck. 
So, the goblin achieved his goal of causing Peter as much pain as possible. Number five, the death of Superman. When a brutal and savage creature called Doomsday came to Earth, he had only one thing on his mind. Destruction. He destroyed a small town and tore through the Justice League as they attacked him. No matter what was thrown at him, Doomsday would not go down. It soon became clear, as Doomsday continued to shrug off attacks, that this was a job for Superman. Superman went up against the creature as Metropolis bore the brunt of the damage. Doomsday was so powerful that Superman had to use the full force of his powers without holding back at all. He took an incredible beating, but managed to kill the creature in the end. Unfortunately, he had taken so much damage while doing so that he passed away in the arms of a distraught Lois Lane. So really, this fight is more of a tie when you think about it. The world was devastated at the loss of Superman as they mourned their hero in a massive funeral and wondered what would become of them now. Perhaps the most devastating element of this affair was that Superman's parents, John and Martha Kent, weren't able to attend their son's funeral as his secret identity would be compromised and because Superman was entombed at a Metropolis memorial, they were unable to bury their son and instead had to bury a few of Clark Kent's possessions instead. Number four, a death in the family. The Joker has made a long career of making Batman miserable by racking up massive body counts while enacting twisted schemes to bring Gotham City to its knees. Batman is usually able to stop the Joker before he achieves his ultimate goal, but sometimes the clown prince of crime gets the better of the Dark Knight. The most infamous example of this was when the Joker captured the second Robin, Jason Todd. He beat him with a crowbar and left him in a warehouse that was rigged to explode. Batman almost got there in time to save Jason, but Robin was blown to smithereens. Batman tried to arrest the Joker, but in a bizarre twist, because the Joker was acting as the ambassador to Iran at the time, he was not charged with the crime due to diplomatic immunity. Batman did stop the Joker from completing his plan to gas the US. UN, but considering that Batman considers losing Jason his greatest failure, that kinda makes it the Joker's greatest win. And considering how much trauma the incident caused Jason once he returned to life, and the fact that it drove him to become a murderous vigilante whose relationship with Batman is tense at best as a result, it has been a long lasting and fruitful victory for the Ace of Knaves known as the Joker, and a bitter defeat for the Dark Knight. Number 3. The Ultimatum Wave In Ultimatum, Meg Magneto has been driven mad at the loss of his children, and decides that rather than destroying humanity in order to make the world safe for mutants, he's just gonna kill everyone. He uses a doomsday device and his powers to shift the world off of its axis, causing disasters all over the globe. Much of Europe, including all of Latveria, is frozen under a layer of ice, and New York is hit by a massive tidal wave. Millions of people all over the world die in the attack, including Nightcrawler and Hank McCoy. Magneto then sends out more of his minions to destroy the heroes, causing the brutal deaths of several more heroes, including Hank Pym, Doctor Strange, and Thor, just to name a few. The most devastating moment is when Pym finds his wife Janet being eaten by the Blob, and responds by entering his giant man form, picking up the Blob and biting his head off. Professor X gets personally murdered by Magneto, and all seems lost. The heroes are eventually able to stop Magneto from destroying the rest of the world, but the initial defeat caused millions of deaths of both heroes and civilians, and the resulting anti-mutant sentiment and pain of the survivors changed things in the Ultimate Universe forever. Number 2. Watchmen's Giant Squid In the Watchmen universe created by Alan Moore, superheroes were outlawed and the United States and Russia are at the brink of nuclear war. The smartest man alive, Adrian Veidt, formerly the hero Ozymandias, came up with a plan to to save the world at the cost of millions of lives. He cloned the brain of a murdered psychic and created a giant psychic squid which he planned to teleport into New York, where it would kill millions of people with a psychic attack, making the world think that they were under attack by aliens, causing them to unite against a common threat. It's slightly more complicated than that, but it's kind of hard to explain, and frankly, you should just read Watchmen if you haven't already. His plan was uncovered by the heroes of the book, who went to Veidt's Arctic Palace to confront 
confront him and try and stop him. But after explaining his evil plan, he clarified that he had already enacted his plan 35 minutes prior and that they were too late to stop him. In order to preserve the peace that had been brought about as a result, the heroes were forced to go along with the charade that Ozymandias had concocted. Number one, Green Lantern loses a planet. In the Cosmic Odyssey series, when the anti-life equation became a sentient creature, it split itself into four pieces. These anti-life aspects each went to a different planet, forcing Darkseid and Highfather to team up with Earth's heroes in order to stop them. Martian Manhunter and the Green Lantern Jon Stewart were sent to the planet Xanshi to deal with the threat and defuse a planet-destroying bomb. The two tracked down the explosive, but feeling that Martian Manhunter was out of his depth, an arrogant steward used his power ring to trap Martian Manhunter in a bubble and send him away, telling him that he would only slow him down. Unfortunately, when Green Lantern got to the explosive, he discovered that it had been painted yellow, making him incapable of diffusing it with his ring. It went off, and though the ring protected Stuart and Manhunter from the blast, the planet and all of its inhabitants were killed due to the Green Lantern's arrogance and carelessness. Martian Manhunter was understandably furious at Stuart, and the Green Lantern was obviously racked with guilt that never really went away. He certainly grew from the experience, but there are a few things more devastating than failing to save an entire planet because you were overconfident in your own abilities. Number 10, Blockbuster. Just like the video rental store that lives far off in a warm place in some of our memories, the villain of the same name, Blockbuster, met a very swift and some could say unjust end. Blockbuster may be a relatively unknown villain to some, and that may be due to the fact that he was primarily a Nightwing villain operating in Bloodhaven. In a tragic series of events, Blockbuster's mother passed away, and Blockbuster blamed this on Nightwing. He set out on a campaign to ruin the hero's life, attempting to take away anything and anyone that mattered to Dick Grayson instead of trying to hurt Nightwing himself. When Nightwing was at his absolute lowest in Nightwing 1996 number 93 from 2004, after a slog of a fight that moved out onto a fire escape, Nightwing had Blockbuster on the ropes when the new vigilante, Tarantula, showed up ready to bring Blockbuster to an end. Now, in a move I just did not see coming, Nightwing leaves his morals at the door, realizing Blockbuster will never stop, and he steps aside to allow Tarantula to end the villain's life. He then went and freaked the hell out while Tarantula started to seduce him. It was really weird, but it happened. Number 9, Spider-Man vs. Fire Lord. I think it is a well-known fact that Spider-Man pulls his punches. It's part of the reason he is one of the best heroes, but I always forget how much he actually pulls those punches. For example, in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 270, a black suited Spider-Man puts one hell of a beating on a former Herald of Galactus, Fire Lord. Previously, Fire Lord had been wandering the cosmos when he stopped in New York to enjoy the uh, culture, I guess, only to be attacked by firemen and then kicked in the face by Spider-Man. Now, the Lord of Fire wants his revenge. After leading Fire Lord on a merry chase through office buildings, Grand Central Station, the subway system, into a construction zone, having a building demolished on top of the fiery villain, and then leading him to a gas station which explodes, Spider-Man, at his wit's end, musters all his effort and his spider sense to lay an incredible incredible beatdown of speed, agility, and raw strength on Fire Lord, getting so lost in his bloodlust until Captain America and the Avengers show up to be like, dude, you got him. Chill out. Number 8, Thor goes for the head. This defeat is devastating in kind of a different way, because ultimately after the events of Avengers Infinity War, the Avengers are left without hope at the beginning of Avengers Endgame. Here our heroes of the MCU go to face Thanos with the help of Captain Marvel. While they do succeed in locating him only two days after his fateful snap, which we all saw at the end of Infinity War, they still arrive too late. Thanos at this point has used the stones to destroy the stones. Not something you can do in the comics, but apparently something you can do in the MCU, leaving our heroes without any foreseeable way to bring back those they have lost, because they have no Infinity Stones to do that with. Frustrated, Thor strikes out against Thanos, cutting off his head with a single swing of Stormbreaker and ultimately defeating him. Even more devastating actually, because with Thanos dead, our heroes are then left without any actual leads on how they might, you know, recover the stones and return those lost back to life. So it's a defeat, but it kind of is a defeat that leaves you going, 
Well, now what? Number seven, Superboy Prime takes a toll. I love Superboy Prime, he's such a brutal villain. For this point, we are headed back to Infinite Crisis, where earlier on, in the same issue as Alexander Luthor's death, Infinite Crisis issue number seven, Superboy Prime is fought against by Superman of the main continuity and Superman of the Golden Age, belonging to Earth 2. The Golden Age, Earth 2. Kind of, I think there's a few Earth 2s at this point. While Superboy Prime is eventually brought to his knees by the combined efforts of both Superman and and the help of Mogo and the other Green Lanterns, the fight is an epic one that cost Golden Age Superman his life in the end, leaving Kara, Power Girl, all alone. Super sad. Truly, this is a really sad, really sad fight. Consequences. Uh, we love a fight with consequences. Number six, Magneto crushes Tarn the Uncaring. Oof. In a way, some might see this fight as one between two villains. However, at the point in history that we're talking about here, the era of Krakoa and Planet Arako, Magneto is not really a villain, and Tarn even is a bit ambiguous when it comes to his role and his alignment. Although, I would say, at the very least, we could consider him to be an antagonist. And myself personally, I actually do consider him, in fact, to be a full fledged villain because Tarn is, well, he's a pretty evil guy. Based on my perception of these characters, I'm including Tarn's defeat here, so that's what we're doing today, friends. At one point, Magneto challenges Tarn to battle, being backed up by Iska, who's kind of tricked into supporting the fight against Tarn by Sunspot. Magneto manages to defeat Tarn in only a few pages, using his helmet both to disable Tarn's telepathic genetic manipulation abilities and then to crush his head. Yikes. Number five, Wonder Woman takes a life. What have I learned from this story? Don't mess with Diana's friends or colleagues. Once more, returning to the story of Infinite Crisis, but this time, the beginning of it, the preamble, in issue number 219 of Wonder Woman, Diana is forced to fight against her longtime friend, Superman, who is revealed to have been basically mind controlled by Maxwell Lord. Now, when Diana realizes this, she heads straight for Lord, but Maxwell refuses to give up his control over Superman, promising Diana that at some point, he will successfully manipulate Superman into killing Batman, or Lois, or even herself. She refuses to accept this, and while Lord is of course tied up with her lasso of truth, she demands that he tell her how to free Superman's mind from his influence, which obviously he's going to be compelled to tell the truth about that. Maxwell responds with simply two words, kill me. And surprisingly, Diana does just that, snapping his neck with her bare hands. Pretty surprising. Although I guess, you know, Wonder Woman is a, a warrior, so sometimes she do be killing people. Number four, Professor X creates an even greater villain. Time to talk about Fatal Attractions. This is the famous X-Men crossover story arc where Magneto uses his magnetism powers to pull out all of the adamantium from Wolverine. Terrifying to behold, but it inspires a possibly even more horrifying reaction from the X-Men's mentor and teacher, Professor X, who snaps after seeing this happen to Logan. He uses his telepathic abilities to completely wipe Magneto's mind, taking away, as he says, his greatest weapons, his hatred, his his ego, his nightmares, Magneto's mind, it's all gone. This would be the catalyst event that would set up Onslaught, a powerful psionic entity who would manifest as a result of the combined darker psyches of both Professor X and Magneto. A devastating defeat, therefore, in many ways, considering, you know, what it leads to much later. Onslaught, I feel like, just goes on forever. Number three, Starro reminisces on happier times. Oh, this one is truly brutal and devastating for me because in a way, Starro was quite a misguided villain. This is like heartbreakingly devastating. In James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, Starro is cast in the role of antagonist, but Starro is not malicious per se, or at least not malicious without you know, cause. Starro is an alien who was captured and used for various experiments as part of Project Starfish. The Suicide Squad has been sent to basically shut down said project after the United States learned of how dangerous the project could be if unleashed on the world. When the team finally uncovers the truth behind Project Starfish, it's too late and they kind of accidentally unleash the captive, mind controlling cosmic being Starro uh, on the world, or at least on Cordo Maltese. Amanda Waller is surprisingly fine with all this as it will destabilize Cordo Maltese which actually benefits the US, so she's like, ah, that's cool. However, the squad decides to rebel against Waller because, I mean, there's a lot of destruction happening around them, a lot of innocent people being taken out, and they decide to take on Starro anyways. Thanks to a combination of commitment and luck, they manage to defeat Starro, but as they lay dying, Starro broadcasts their last thoughts, reminiscing on what their life was like prior to being taken captive on Earth, saying, I was very happy, floating, 
staring at the stars. Sad last words. Number two, Nova annihilates Annihilus. In Annihilation issue number six, we see one of the most devastating villain defeats of all time. Or at least, you know, one of the most devastating methods of defeating a villain, I would say. It's happened a few times this way in the comics, actually, and each time it's still pretty devastating. Here we see this method used when Nova takes on Annihilus and defeats him by basically like ripping his spine out through his throat. Ah, uh, what a way to go. I don't even know if we can actually show this one on YouTube. I don't even know if I could say that on YouTube, but I did, so I guess we'll see if it makes it in the cut. It's just, it's that devastating of a moment. Number one, Peacemaker faces his dad. This one was a disturbing, heart-wrenching, and shocking moment from season one of Peacemaker, a series that surprised me in so many different and delightful ways. One such startling moment happens when Peacemaker is forced to face off against his dad, White Dragon. While we know pretty early on that Peacemaker's dad, Augie Smith, is pretty much the worst role model or parent anyone could ask for, we also see that Chris Smith, aka Peacemaker, still cares deeply for his father despite all the awful things his dad has done to him throughout his life. Rather than rightfully blame his father for his messed up upbringing, which honestly he should do, Chris seems to blame himself almost just as much, if not more, making the moment when he actually faces his father a pretty tense one. Years of pent up rage, disappointment, shame, and frustration manifest in a single instant when White Dragon goads his son into killing him, commenting on the fact that he doesn't believe his son is in essence strong enough or man enough to even do so. And in the process, causing Peacemaker to snap, pushing him past the brink and resulting in, well, Chris doing just that, killing his own supervillain father, pretty brutally too, so. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, it's Tim Drake. This first Joker defeat comes in Detective Comics number 826. Kicking off the action in this story, Tim Drake, Robin, is on the run from some criminals and barely keeping it together when a random car pulls up and offers him an escape. Taking the free help, Robin jumps on the opportunity only to find out the driver of the said car is the Joker himself, wearing a Santa hat. Joker hits him with some knockout gas and when Tim comes back too, he's tied up and gagged in the passenger seat of the car with his utility belt tossed out the window. While going on this horrific joyride with the Joker where he took the lives of multiple people, Tim proved just how great of a Robin he'd become by completely taking the Joker off guard by quoting the Marx Brothers. Joker loves this, but then Tim starts purposely getting the facts of his quotes wrong, distracting the Joker who tries to correct the young Robin while Tim gets his hand free and then sucks Joker with a real good punch right across the jaw. He then grabs the rear view mirror and smacks the clown over the head with it and then jumps in the back seat where he gets the upper hand on the Joker, taking his own gas and spraying it in the Joker's face. Joker goes flying out the car door and has to throw himself off of a bridge to avoid getting hit by a truck. He got a Robin once, but he ain't gonna get this one. Number nine. Tax evasion. In Detective Comics number 180, the clown prince of crime ends up inheriting $250 million from the recently deceased King Barlow. With all this money, the Joker decides to retire from crime and goes on a shopping spree. Understandably so. In an almost too real turn of events though, the Joker has to pay the IRS an inheritance tax of more than he actually has remaining or he faces going to jail for tax evasion. Of all the things that the Joker has done, it's tax evasion that is truly what threatens him the most. And knowing the way the government comes after people who evade their taxes, that actually kind of makes sense. But what makes the whole thing so much worse for the Joker is that he learns that the money he inherited is all fake, and the whole thing was actually a prank from King Barlow. The Joker can either admit the money is counterfeit, which would cause him to become the laughing stock of the criminal underworld, or evade the government for life for the ruthless crime of tax evasion. Instead, the Joker chooses option number three and decides to try to steal some money only for Batman to stop him and put him in Arkham Asylum yet again. In an eight reverse flash, a pride point for speedsters, especially evil speedsters, is how fast they can move, how they're faster than a speeding bullet and how they're basically impossible to hit. So imagine our surprise when reverse flash ends up getting popped in the head by none other than Thomas Wayne in the flashpoint timeline so Barry could access enough speed force to save the world and 
bring his son back. Well, bring Thomas's son back. And while this apparently killed Thon, that was far from it. Thon started vibrating so fast as he could actually slow the destruction of his brain, and this actually gave Thon more time to try and avoid death, and gave him the ability to hold the grudge. Humiliated by getting killed by Batman of all people, Thon sets out to be even worse than usual, even ripping up the letter that Thomas gave Barry to give to Bruce. The only contact that Bruce had with his parents since they had died. Well, the only contact a, a living version had. Which is absolutely brutal, okay? Batman was ugly crying. It was kind of weird. But I mean, come on, speedster getting shot in the head. It's pretty dumb. Number 7. Pepper reigns in an evil Tony Stark. The amount of times heroes have actually had to take on Iron Man is staggering. I mean, you'd think considering how massive of a hero he is, especially now with his story becoming a worldwide sensation thanks to the MCU, that Iron Man would typically have some of his worst battles against villains, not heroes. But yeah, Iron Man has done some bad stuff in the past, which has meant that even his closest friends and allies such as Pepper Potts have had to turn against him. In this instance, Tony Tony had his alignment reversed during the events of Axis, but rather than allow them to be flipped back, he instead remained a villain even after the event had ended. Tony saw himself as a superior version with no morals to hold him back, becoming known as Superior Iron Man. As such, Pepper was ultimately forced to take him down with the help of an earlier version of Tony who he dubbed Inferior Iron Man. Number 6. Nothing can tame Bruce Banner Starting off Hulk issue number 1 with a bang, Donny Cates had Hulk face off against Iron Man in his Hulkbuster armor. Not just one Hulkbuster though, a whole entourage of them. Hulk here being piloted like a spaceship by Bruce Banner, who is in control of Hulk on the inside, even manages to learn that Tony isn't actually inside these suits, but is hiding elsewhere, remote piloting them. He literally learns this by ripping them apart, and then Tony is like, how did you know I wasn't in that suit? And he's like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm crazy. Hulk then finds the real armor Tony and starts wailing on him. Even when Stark attempts to appeal to Bruce's better nature, trying to talk him down, Hulk does not relent. Number 5. Thor's Apocalyptic Clone Thor and Iron Man don't always get along, despite them both being colleagues and friends who are both Avengers. Following the first superhero civil war in the comics, the two ended up having some pretty big beef, thanks to Tony making some questionable decisions during that era. Chiefly, it was revealed that Stark had acquired a genetic sample of his friend Thor. I'm just imagining Tony like at the Avengers Mansion or something, raiding through Thor's like hairbrush late one night for those sweet, sweet genetic samples. He's like, ha ha ha, I have his hair, I can use this at some point. And he decided to keep these genetic samples for a rainy day, in case he ever needed to make, let's say, a Thor clone. After Thor died, that's what he did, creating Ragnarok, Thor's bald and villainous clone who would end up being recruited to Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers. Needless to say, Thor was not too happy to hear of this upon his return to the realm of the living and ended up revealing just how displeased he was in a one on one fight against Iron Man, which went as well for Tony as you would probably imagine. After all, Thor is a god. Thor wouldn't kill Tony, but he definitely made sure to make it known that if he wanted to end Iron Man's life, he could with ease. Number 4. Black Panther Gets Creative Who is smarter, Tony Stark or T'Challa? Most people would pick Tony for this kind of versus, but Christopher Priest Black Panther would say otherwise. In issue number 45 of the 1998 Black Panther series, Iron Man in a stealth suit faces off against Black Panther. This stealth suit was specifically designed for such a task, with Tony attempting to anticipate both Black Panther's offensive and defensive abilities. But what he can seem to prepare for is just how brilliant T'Challa is, with him demonstrating how resourceful, creative, and brilliant he is in his brutal takedown of Iron Man's stealth armor. Sneaking up on T'Challa, it turns out, is kind of always a bad idea. Number 3. Thanos Wins In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, technically one of the greatest defeats of all happened to Iron Man 2. This was when Thanos initially won against all the heroes of Earth and succeeded in collecting all the Infinity Stones and using them to snap half of the population out of existence. It was a wild time for us, and I'm sure the heroes alike. Iron Man learned that the heroes had lost back when he was left stranded on another world, the home world of the mad titan Thanos known as Titan. Not sure if he'd even make his way home ever again. He also ended up being one of the few people left alive after the battle had been fought and Thanos snapped. Iron Man was there to see his protege Spider-Man turn to dust before his eyes as one of the casualties of the events of Infinity War. Number 2. Black Widow Does the Unimaginable Black Widow majorly betrayed Iron Man in the Ultimate Universe. While she didn't defeat him at the end of the day, her turning on him came with a pretty great cost, so I'd still say it was a defeat in a way. And while Iron Man did ultimately win in the end, he himself was still standing, I would argue 
argue that initially Iron Man was seemingly defeated in ways by Black Widow who caught him off guard. Also sure, it's not main continuity, but it's honestly so bad it needs to be acknowledged and mentioned here. In the Ultimate Universe, Black Widow was only posing as a hero, but was really in secret a villain the whole time, simply pretending to defect to get in with the heroes and then betray them and the United States. She was engaged to be married to Tony Stark and ended up breaking off the engagement when she revealed her true colors. She attempted to steal Tony's fortune and tragically killed his loyal butler and friend Jarvis as well. Number 1. Thanos' Henchwoman Wins Not only has Thanos won against Tony Stark before, but in the comics, Thanos didn't even fight directly against Tony during the Infinity Gauntlet saga. He apparently had less respect for Iron Man than he expressed in the MCU. Instead of fighting Iron Man one on one, Thanos decided to deploy Taraxia. Taraxia was basically created by Thanos in his image to act as his partner after death rejected him. As such, Taraxia basically looks like Thanos but with a feminine shape and a head full of long blue hair. She was tasked with taking on the heroes at Thanos' behest and did so with great pleasure. When facing Iron Man in Infinity Gauntlet issue number 4, she brutally defeats him by removing his head from his body. Number 10. Tormented and Defeated on Repeat When Joker received 99.9% .9 of Mr. Mixipiz Yidalik's power, he used this power to wreak all kinds of havoc. One of the things he used these new epic reality warping powers for was to torment Batman forever on repeat. Daily, Emperor Joker would severely torment and kill Batman, although in the end, Batman was the key to Joker's defeat, being Joker's one true weakness, since his identity was so closely tied to Batman's. However, Batman was left so traumatized from this whole experience that he became a broken man, a shadow of his former self, unable to operate as a hero. Superman actually had to steal his memories of the experience away in order to return Batman to himself once more so he could resume being a hero and just not being like a complete mess all the time. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us by clicking that like button. Number 9, A League of One. Superheroes don't always lose to supervillains in the comics. In the case of the JLA story A League of One, this time around the League is actually defeated by one of their own, Wonder Woman. However, Wonder Woman doesn't do this to actually cause them harm or, you know, kill them, but simply to get them just out of the way. This is because the League is facing a dragon and there is actually a prophecy that it will cost the group of heroes their lives. Wonder Woman not only manages to defeat the League, but also manages to sidestep her own doomed fate upon facing that dragon. Number 8. Loss of his parents Obviously, one of the worst defeats to happen to Batman happened to him when he was simply known as young Bruce Wayne. This would be the loss of his parents. Without them dying, he wouldn't be the man he is today, for better or for worse. The death of his parents tormented young Bruce so much that it, along with another freak encounter with a bat, inspired him to become the masked vigilante known as Batman. So in a way, it's this trauma that has led to so many of the other awful experiences that Batman has suffered through, countless physical injuries as well as mental and emotional turmoil, and both victories but also other defeats as well. Number 7. You are not my father. Probably one of the most emotional fights, especially when we consider that at the time we had a lot of complex emotions about, uh, well, at least one of these people, happens between Professor Charles Xavier and his star pupil, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. I'll let you guess about who he had complex feelings about. This one went down during the events of Avengers vs. X Men. It happens at a tense time in the history of the X Men, not just because they were up against and at conflict with the Avengers as a result of a debate about what to do with the incoming Phoenix Force, but because of the revelations that had happened in recent years in regards to Charles's more shady practices. Like not telling his students that the danger room they were training in had actually itself become a sentient AI mutant who was in essence uh, kind of being oppressed by the headmaster of the Xavier Institute, for example. In the end, Charles attempted to talk down Scott, who at this point had the full power of the Phoenix Force, or he takes the full power of the Phoenix Force during this fight, and uses it at his fingertips. Basically, he was also being corrupted by that. Himself filled with a bunch of complex feelings at the time in regards to Charles, Cyclops ends up refusing his once mentor's help and instead kills him in a blaze of phoenix flames. Despite the fact that Charles at this point was a controversial figure, he was still, I would say, considered to be more hero than villain. And despite the fact that Cyclops himself is usually known for being a hero, he still defeated a man often also known for his own heroic and idealistic dreams. Number 6. The Day the Proudest Most Noble Man Ever Finally Fell Obviously I'm kinda trimming down that quote a bit, but 
It just fits a little bit better in my point. What an iconic defeat. So iconic it not only shook the comic book world, but also the everyday world as well, making headlines. And sure, all in all, this was kind of a publicity stunt to help boost comic sales, but it also became a huge story for comic book fans everywhere to look back on for years to come. While Superman would return, his defeat against Doomsday and ultimate initial death in the comics would be felt the world over. The death of Superman is epic, and I personally always like like coming back to it, not just for Clark himself, but for the characters that are a big part of his world. Lois and Jimmy, his parents, John and Martha, ugh, oh, makes me feel so many emotions. Also, why was Jimmy so handsome in the 90s? I ask myself that every time I return to Superman comics in the 90s. I'm like, Jimmy, you're looking real jacked. Number five, take heart, kitty. Oof, this one hits me right in the feels. I go back to what it felt like the first time I read this one, and whoo, it got me. This defeat comes to us from the pages of one of my favorite ever X books, I believe, the first volume of Marauders, which started back in 2019. I think this is one of my favorite X books of all time. I mean, I'd have to really like think about that and rank those, but pretty sure this is up there if it's not in the top five. Although, I think it is in the top five. For me. In issue number six, we're caught off guard when Sebastian Shaw shows up on a boat where Captain Kate, the leader of the Marauders, has been left alone. Now, for those who haven't been keeping up with, you know, the Krakoa era X Men stuff and what it means for Kitty Pride, initially she had problems using the gates on the island and basically became the captain of a ship and the leader of the Marauders. Not Sinister's Marauders, not those Marauders. She was reclaiming the name for a heroic group of buccaneers that would basically sail the seas and help to free mutants in countries where they otherwise were not free helping to bring them to Krakoa. And honestly, the team is also star-studded. Here, Kitty preferred to go by Kate. That is, until she died. Sebastian Shaw shows up to attack Kate with fast-growing Krakoa seeds. Considering she can't use the gates and currently can't phase through Krakoan materials, Kate becomes restrained as a result. Lockheed is netted and tossed overboard, and Kate is left to sink alone along with the ship she is on, which Sebastian, of course, blows a hole in. This plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected as this plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected by the five as a result of her inability to interact with Krakoan Gates. Number four, everything cracked. The final crisis story is all about the brutal defeat of superheroes and really kind of like everyone on Earth. Final Crisis was the story of how Darkseid basically took over the world by broadcasting the anti-life equation to everyone on the planet via email, text, radio, and television broadcasts, basically making them realize that he is the one true ruler of everything and so they may as well just give up and surrender to him. It was brutal, devastating, and honestly affected pretty much everybody in the comics. Eventually the heroes would manage to rise up and take back the planet, but for a while there, oh, it was really bleak. Things got so bad that they even caused Batman to break his one rule against using guns in order to take on Darkseid. And this event started with the death of Martian Manhunter as well. Rough. Number three, the one true enemy of the great Charles Xavier. Oh boy, we are going to the ultimate universe for this one, so you know it's gonna be brutal, right? This comes from the Ultimate X-Men series. Here, Sinister, who looks super different in this universe, so if you're like, wait a minute, who's that? That's Sinister? Yeah, it is. He infiltrates the X-Mansion and manages to sneak up on Charles Xavier himself, despite his immense telepathic powers. Xavier here is no match for Sinister, who takes him out of the security room he was in, where he was seemingly surveying his students. When Charles asks Sinister where he's taking him, Sinister responds that he's escorting Xavier to his one true enemy, and then he pushes him down some stairs. Mm. It's completely awful, really. Xavier isn't the only one who gets brutally and honestly, insultingly messed up by Sinister in this issue. Angel, also in this fight, goes from being intimidating in one panel to basically mentally manipulated into choking himself against his will in another panel. So, yeah. Which I mean, I don't know. I kind of expect something like that for Angel, but Xavier? It's not fair. It's not very, that's terrible. <laughs> Number two, instead I will simply break you. Possibly one of the most powerful moments I've ever read in Batman comics. This epic issue that was an integral part of the Nightfall story is a whirlwind of a fight. And not only that, but overseen by a powerful inner monologue from Batman about all the wounds he has taken to get to this point that truly highlights the struggles that really sum up this character, who against all odds always comes out on top, right? 
not this time. And issue number 497 of Batman. This was the moment that Bruce fell in his fight against Bane. Bane came to finish him, but rather than kill Batman, decided to simply leave him broken, breaking his back over his knee in that massive and iconic splash panel. Number one, but I saved you. I did it. Oh, this one made me cry all over again as I sat at my desk and reflected on it, revisiting it again. Oh boy, okay. So here we're talking about the death of Spider-Man, which honestly happened more than once in the ultimate comic book line and universe, but I do think that this is my favorite death. Hmm. This is Spider-Man's death done right, is what I mean, in my mind. If you have to do it, obviously, because I don't think many of us would really ask for something this heartbreaking to happen, but you know, here we are, it happened, and it's so sad. During Ultimate Spider-Man issue 159 through to issue 160, we see Peter in his final fight, in the final moments of this final fight. Unmasked and with nothing really left to lose, he is forced to give it his all to protect the people of New York City, and more specifically, his friends friends, his family, his loved ones, and the people of his own neighborhood. In the end, despite everything he does in this epic fight, which spans multiple issues, he is defeated by the Green Goblin. And the ultimate version of the Green Goblin is an unstoppable, and as we'd later find out, a mortal tank of a villain. This fight and defeat has it all though. Ups, downs, it's an emotional, action-packed roller coaster. And while Spider-Man does seemingly die, so seemingly does Norman Osborn as well in the end. So while this is a defeat, there's also at least some poetic justice felt in the end too. But goodness, Aunt May, whew. Boy, do I feel for Aunt May here. Oh, it's so awful. Number 10, just his bones and a beautiful memory. This one chokes me up every time. It's not only physically brutal, but emotionally brutal. Like so many superhero defeats that stick with me truly seem to be. In this case, it is Superman himself who is defeated by his friend and ally, Wonder Woman. This all goes down in the story from outside of the main continuity, Wonder Woman Dead Earth. In this comic, Diana awakens in a post-apocalyptic world where she seems to have forgotten what happened to the planet. There was a great war and following it a great fire and it is in issue 3 that she actually finds out the truth about what happened to this now dead earth and her involvement in that. What happened was the great fire and the great fire was her. In the past, in Dead Earth, the Amazons attacked humankind, and while Diana attempted to lead peace talks between both sides, this ultimately fails, and then the humans decide to basically nuke Themyscira. Diana's full power is unleashed when her bracelets are removed, but it's not enough to stop the nuclear strike against her home. In the end, her mom, her sisters, her entire world are all destroyed and lost to her. Superman rushes to help, but also arrives too late after prioritizing his own parents, who also were victims of a nuclear attack in small her power fully unleashed, heartbroken, and filled with rage, Wonder Woman takes out her frustrations on Superman. The two fight, and ultimately, this untethered and unlimited power that Diana has tapped into proves to be enough for her to destroy Clark after their fight also has obliterated the Earth via collateral damage. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button? I know there's a bunch of you that aren't subscribed, so, you know, if you want to subscribe, it just it helps us out. Number 9. the Justice League are dead. Welcome to Dark Crisis. Or really, welcome to Justice League issue number 75, the beginning of Dark Crisis. In this issue, the Justice League goes up against Pariah. Pariah used to be a scientist, trying to stop the death of universes, who basically became corrupted when he was cursed to watch worlds end over and over again, without being able to do anything to save them. I mean, to be fair, that would, I think, make pretty much anyone corrupted and kind of crazy. Pariah is back, and this time he intends to end the suffering of the multiverse by ending the heroes of the main continuity. He does this because he believes in destroying the main continuity, he'll kind of be able to end the cycle of destruction, seeing it as kind of the root of the problem because the heroes from that reality have in essence meddled too much with the state of the multiverse. So he's like, in order for us to save the multiverse, we kind of got to get rid of you guys. As a result, he seemingly handily defeats the Justice League in one go, blasting them with his own power after making them fight sort of the darkness, which is like an army of evil characters they fought before, but really it's just the darkness, leaving only Black Adam to survive, return to Earth, and tell the tale of what happened. Of course, the Justice League would return, because, you know, this is comics, we gotta come back around to it. But still, this issue and their initial fate here was pretty wild. Number eight, and that will be the end of the X-Men forever! What can I say? 
I'm a sucker for the classics. This one comes to us from the old days of X Men, the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee days, and issues number 17 and 18 of Uncanny X Men. Magneto is revealed to be the villain who has infiltrated the X Mansion, having returned from outer space where we last saw him be transported to by the Beyonder. He has returned to once more resume getting revenge on the X Men and mankind. It isn't until the end of issue 17 that Magneto is revealed as he greets the parents of Warren Worthington III, aka mutant student Angel's parents, having handily defeated almost all the X Men one by one after luring them to the mansion. Magneto's plan is to send them up in an air balloon, which is basically like attached to a metal ball that contains them. Fortunately, while initially defeated in issue number 17 and struggling to escape in issue number 18, Iceman ends up getting showcased as the true hero in this issue. Kind of helps save the day here, almost single handedly defeating Magneto just as the X Men escape their deadly air balloon fate and return to back him up. In at number 7 is the Superman Revenge Squad. After discovering the planet of the Superman Revenge Squad, Superman wastes no time at all and charges at the planet with a full frontal assault armed with nothing but his abilities and a strange package attached to his chest. The Revenge Squad fires all their most dangerous, most powerful weapons at Superman, firing everything they think will take out the Man of Steel. They all impact on Kal-El and the villains think they've won. For a moment. But when the dust settled, they didn't even leave a scratch. Instead, the package on Superman's chest detonated, encircling the whole planet in a layer of mist. Now, Superman then yells down to the villains from the heavens, explaining if any of them pass through the mist leaving the planet, they will suffer total amnesia, forgetting any hatred they have for Superman. They can remain trapped on their base, being angry and upset, or they can rejoin the cosmos devoid of all grudges. Either way, he doubts he will ever see them again, and then he just flies on back home. And in at number 6, Simon. Simon Jones is a villain of the Teen Titans who has vast telekinesis and telepathic powers, and he is also the leader of the Fearsome Five. All of that, but he basically just calls himself Simon, but, but, but cool because there's a P in front of it, so we know that he is a, a psychic, psychic dude, I guess. Cool. In Salvation Run number 2, Simon is among the new Injustice League when a bunch of villains, including them, get exiled to an alien world. Simon, who is standing among some pretty big name villains, attempts to convince his fellow supervillains that escape is impossible, and so he then proceeds to lay down plans for beginning a new civilization, involving all the female villains getting pregnant and giving birth as soon and as frequently as possible. But luckily, the Joker is also here, and he doesn't seem to be a fan. Joker very, very abruptly interrupts Simon, tossing a rock that hits the guy square in the noggin, and then running up and smashing Simon over the head repeatedly with a rock, assuming control. Number 5, Captain Boomerang. This brutal defeat is so quick and so abrupt, there isn't even much I can really say about it other than you should never put a captain up against a general. In 2016 Suicide Squad, in literally the second issue, Task Force X are sent on a mission to Russia to retrieve or destroy an unknown device. Well, turns out that the device is actually a portal, a portal to the Phantom Zone. Rather than leave it be, which would probably have been smart, Captain Boomerang approaches the portal and is almost instantly incinerated down to his ankles by none other than General Zod, using his heat vision. I doubt the Boomerang guy would have been able to help much in the squad's fight against Zod, and honestly it's a miracle any of them survived at all, but I never expected this to happen so abruptly and to one of the main members of the squad. And in at number 4 is Mr. Mixelpidilic. The villain known as Mr. Mixelpidilic is both incredibly powerful, but he also doesn't really do anything that bad. He's usually just a big old nuisance. In Superman Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, a whole bunch of Superman's villains all make their play on the Man of Steel, and when their threat is ended, Superman is still left wondering why the heck this is all happening, when he realizes the only villain that wasn't among them was the fifth dimensional imp himself, which is when he finally reveals himself. Himself. He goes on about how, being completely immortal, he gets really, really bored. He spent 2,000 years just floating around doing nothing, and then 2,000 years doing good deeds and being nice, and then he spent 2,000 years being a mischievous little imp, and now, of all times, he decides he's gonna start being evil, and his first evil act is to kick off the next two millennia well, by taking out Superman. That's basically what he says. But I don't think it was like that. Anyways, Mr. Mix reveals his horrendous true form and goes on the attack. 
Unfortunately, Superman's girl Lois Lane figured out what to do. Superman grabbed the Phantom Zone projector, and as he was about to use it on this magical imp, Mr. Mix spoke his name backwards, which would return him back to the fifth dimension. Unfortunately, this happened simultaneously, and Mixelpidilic was torn in half between both the Phantom Zone and the Fifth Dimension. And apparently, Superman did this completely on purpose, and then he runs off to go and sulk about it. Number three, Dinosaurus. The Viltrumites from the Invincible comic series are a race of near invulnerable, incredibly strong, world conquering aliens. But none among them stands as strong and as invulnerable as Grand Regent Thrag. Battle hardened over thousands of years, only the most powerful character can even hope to stand mano y mano against this powerhouse. David Anders, the villain known as Dinosaurus, is not one of those characters. While Dinosaurus is very, very strong, it's more so his intelligence that is his greatest weapon. Dinosaurus allied himself with Invincible around issue 90 of the comic, and in an attempt on Mark's life by Thrag, Dinosaurus comes to Invincible's aid, which he had to know would not go well. Dinosaurus attacks Thrag, but his claws shatter like glass on Thrag's skin. Thrag then proceeds to pummel Mr. Anders, only stopping when he was distracted by an explosion. This brief moment of pause gave Dinosaurus the chance to chomp on the Grand Regent's head. But unfortunately, just like his claws, Dino's teeth also completely shatter, not even leaving a scratch on Thrag, which gives Thrag the chance to first mock the guy, but then break his jaw and leave him to think about his mistake. And in at number two is Vulcan. In recent years, the red planet that was formerly known to us as Mars has become home to a group of mutants known as the Iraqi, who renamed the planet to Araco. These mutants differ from the Krakoan mutants we know by years and years of a constant battle for survival. Because of that, the Iraqi are a warlike people. They despise weakness and take on almost any challenge as a means of strengthening themselves. Because of this, duels and challenges are a key part of Iraqi society. Now, the Iraqi the are ruled by a group called the Great Ring of Araco, which is made up of almost completely Omega level mutants. One of those mutants is an incredibly disliked guy by the name of Tarn the Uncaring. Now another Omega level mutant who is also pretty unliked by a lot of people is a guy by the name of Gabriel Summers, aka Vulcan, who wields massive energy manipulation abilities, which he can use to take away mutant powers. The problem is, Tarn's ability is also to take away mutant powers. As part of a big convoluted plan, Vulcan challenged Tarn for his seat on the Great Ring of Araco, which all comes to a head in X-Men Red Issue 3 from 2022. Just as the fight begins, both mutants simultaneously negate each other's powers, turning their fight into a straight up physical altercation. At first, Vulcan gets in a few good hits meaning two, he gets two hits. But he didn't seem to take Tarn's face tentacles into account, one of which catches Vulcan's fist, allowing Tarn to land a face shattering punch. He then grabs Vulcan's arm with one hand and completely snaps it, then slams his face into the Colosseum floor and crushes it with three swift punches, winning the fight. And in a number one is Tarn the Uncaring. Ooh, surprise, you thought that was the end of the story. Well, nope. Right after Tarn has turned Vulcan into a floor decoration, he celebrates his win, exclaiming that he is unkillable and asking who will challenge him now. And to his surprise, someone answers. You see, another powerful mutant who is also hanging out on Araco is none other than Magneto, who has been featured a few times in this series. Magneto comes floating into the Colosseum with his helmet and calls Tarn a stain on the planet, challenging the recently victorious mutant whose psychokinetic power stealing abilities have now returned. But if you think that will put Magneto at a disadvantage, you are sorely mistaken. Iraqi combatants are allowed to use weapons outside of their powers, and like I said, Magneto had his helmet, which, if you were unaware, blocks mental powers. Before Tarn even finishes his sentence to accept the challenge, Magneto uses his metal controlling powers to slam his helmet onto Tarn's head, blocking his powers from being used, and then, in one swift move, he crushes the helmet and Tarn's head like a can of pop. It's so fast and so ruthless, and it's the most badass moment I have ever seen. Mwah. Beautiful. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil versus Bullseye. Imagine being the guy who continuously gets his butt handed to him by Daredevil to the point that you've been saved and brought back too multiple times with enhancements and he still leaves you stuck in an iron lung with the ability to do nothing but stare and talk 
very quietly. Imagine being that guy, and in another act of attempted vengeance, you mastermind a whole evil plan to get your revenge with your limited communication abilities, and then in Daredevil Volume 3, number 27, this red suited man without fear unravels your plans and then makes sure the jar that's keeping you alive gets filled with a toxic chemical, leaving you completely blind. Well, that's what happened to Bullseye. As Foggy Nelson said, once the deadliest man in the world, and now all he will be is a living brain inside a flesh and bone coffin. That's terrifying. Number 9. The Hulk vs. Abomination Abomination in the MCU was once an incredibly intimidating villain. And he still sort of is, but also like, kind of like a hippie? And kind of funny? In the comics though, Emil Blonsky is absolutely ruthless. General rule for the MCU movies for you right here. If you like a character, just imagine them doing everything they do, but like turn it up to 10 and then you'll have their comic book counterpart. Mostly. What my point is here is that the Abomination is psychotic and the Hulk is way more brutal. So when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easy. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I've ever seen. Emil comes walking out of the water and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the bobby. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels under water and through a dam, flooding a whole town, all the while these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. And then Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which is just dumb because it just makes him angrier, increasing his strength, and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist after fist, causing minor earthquakes and leaving Emil on the edge of life with his brain exposed. It's insane. This comic really shows the relationship between these two on a level that's not really captured anywhere else, and you should read it just for their relationship, honestly. Number 8. Peter Parker vs. Kingpin If there's one thing you just don't do, it's messing with Aunt May. After Peter had revealed his identity to the world, his past villains were all coming back to get some more personal revenge. This put his family in danger, and despite Despite his best attempts to protect them, when an assassin tried to bring him down, he dodged out of the way and Aunt May happened to be in the line of fire. This transitioned immediately to the Back in Black Spider-Man arc, which saw Peter don his black spider suit and go on a war path to find out who was responsible for hiring the assassin. Eventually, Peter learns that it was none other than Kingpin who hired the goon. Fisk was in prison at this time, but using an extremely large stash of cash that he somehow had hidden within his prison furniture. I don't know, it's a comic book, just roll with it. Fisk was able to get out of his cell, release the other inmates, and get about halfway through the prison before Spider-Man came crashing in. And after letting Kingpin monologue a little bit, he proceeds to lay an incredible beatdown on the Kingpin of crime in front of an entire prison wing of his underlings. But then, to make it much more personal, Spider-Man takes off the black suit to show that it, it's Peter Parker beating the snot out of Kingpin. Then he slaps the hell out of Fisk, threatens to spin webbing down his throat, and then explains how pathetic he is in front of all of his underlings, striking right at the Kingpin's massive pride. Number 7. Jericho vs. Vigilante Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is technically usually a superhero, despite being the son of Deathstroke, one of the world's best assassins. The same serum that gave Deathstroke his powers and enhancements also gave Jericho his powers, but they differ largely from Deathstroke's. Jericho has a very unique and powerful ability that allows him to transfer his consciousness into the body of another and take control of them by making eye contact with that person. Unfortunately, Every time he did this, a small shred of the individual's psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, but over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches running around his head, it drove him insane and put him on a warpath that needed to see him brought down. The rogue anti-hero known as Vigilante was the one to take on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. But because of Jericho's sister insisting that Jericho was a good person at heart and should not lose his life, Vigilante decided to not deal with this threat in a completely lethal way. No, instead, 
Vigilante just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. Blind and unable to use his powers, the threat of his abilities was gone. But I'm pretty sure it did nothing to stop his mental instability. In fact, it likely made it worse. Number 6. Wally West vs Inertia Inertia was a young villainous Thaddeus Thawn. Inertia is to Bart Allen aka Impulse what Eobard Thawne is to Barry Allen. He is his reverse. Now, Inertia had been raised his whole life to absolutely despise speedsters of any kind. He learned to be a villain from others, but his actions were all of his own. So, when Inertia made the mistake of taking the life of his opposite, Bart Allen, he would be made to suffer the consequences. Unfortunately for him, those consequences came in the form of Wally West, one of the most powerful speedsters ever. After taunting Wally about the fact he just took the life of his sidekick, in All Flash number 1, Wally takes the young villain who had the potential to be reformed, mind you, and removes his ability to move at all, traps Inertia in a museum as one of the exhibits, only able to blink once every hundred years, and leaves the kid there still thinking in real time during all of this. Meaning he's driven slowly and pretty surely insane. And just as the cherry on top, Wally left him facing the exhibit of Bart Allen, the man that Inertia could have been. It's an incredibly dark fate for a hero to impose on a villain, especially one that small. Number 5. Superman vs The Joker The Injustice video game and comic books took the simple premise of an evil Superman and turned it into an awesome story with really cool moments. The designs created for the heroes are mostly really really cool and only slight variations of their best looks. The reasons that heroes and villains choose sides against one another is also really really cool, and it gives some of the most ridiculous shows a force for Superman himself. But it all kicks off with one simple event. The Joker decides that he has become bored of Gotham, so he turns his gaze on Metropolis. The dark and twisted games that this character plays work really well with Batman, who is in reality just a normal human named Bruce Wayne. But when the Joker has to face someone with actual power, he is exponentially way more likely to come out on the bottom. So when he decided to crack Superman by tricking the hero into ending the life of Lois Lane and then blowing up a large part of Metropolis, he does succeed for just a few hours, until Superman shows up in the room where the clown is being interrogated by Batman, and Superman just bursts in, ignoring Batman completely, and in one cold move, he plunges his fist straight through the Joker's chest, stopping his heart immediately. And number 4, Midnight vs Commander. The Authority is a really, really cool group from DC Comics' Wildstorm universe. The two most well known heroes from the team would be Apollo and Midnighter, who are basically like Superman and Batman. Man, respectively, only these two are husband and husband, and Midnighter is almost insane. He is like Batman, but like Batman who is also mixed with the Punisher and maybe like a bit of Deadpool. And these stories get Dark. In Mark Miller's run on the Authority, a villain by the name of Commander makes the very big mistake of attacking and forcing himself on Apollo. This was a hell of a mistake, because in response to those actions, Apollo, after recovering, burns Commander's legs so that he can't escape, and Midnighter shows up with a jackhammer. And the rest is something we are kept from seeing. If you want to check it out for yourself, you may be my guest, but you've been warned, it is quite haunting. Number 3. Captain Cold vs Johnny Quick If you have not read Forever Evil, I highly recommend you do. It's such a dark and crazy story that sees the villains of the DC Universe step into the heroic side to take down an evil Justice League from the alternate reality of Earth 3. Each member of this crime syndicate of America is a sick and twisted perversion of their prime Earth counterpart. But of all of them, Johnny Quick, the stand in for the Flash, may be the most messed up. He's a completely deranged serial killer in his world. And one villain just can't stand for someone dragging the Flash's name in the dirt like that. Leonard Snart, Captain. And cold. In their confrontation, Mr. Quick gets a hold of Cold's weapon, the Cold Gun, and then gloats about how he had taken the life of the alternate Snart on Earth 3 and how Captain Cold is defenseless without his finger on the trigger of his weapon. Well, it turns out that Snart singing Jingle Bells Batman Smells activates the Cold Gun voice trigger, which then completely freezes Quick's leg, which is when Captain Cold takes his big old right boot heel and completely shatters this maniac's leg. Have fun accessing the Speed Force now, psycho! Ha <laughs> ha!
And at number two, Black Panther and the Skrulls. Wakanda, like the other fictional kingdoms of Atlantis and Latveria, is protected by a man who will do anything to protect his people. T'Challa doesn't really have the luxury of sparing those that would do harm to his incredibly advanced home. But Wakanda is also one of the number one places targeted when an invading force wants to take over Earth. So, taking those two facts into account, when the Skrulls tried to invade Wakanda to start their mission of dominating the world, T'Challa and his wife Storm of the X-Men left those aliens with a clear message. After tricking the Skrulls into inflicting pain on their own men for information, the Skrulls sent out their best warriors for the task of taking down the pair. But just as those toughest warriors are gone from sight, an army of Wakandan soldiers breaks into the Skrull ship and leaves not a single Skrull soul alive. While that's happening, those quote toughest warriors are turned into pulp by Black Panther, with T'Challa using their blood to write quote, this is what happens when you invade Wakanda on the bridge of the Skrull ship, cold. Number one, Constantine versus Dr. Fate. It's funny, I never really thought I'd see Dr. Fate as a villain, and in a way this isn't exactly that, it's more like the helmet of fate and Naboo himself is the villain. In Constantine Future's End, John has stolen the Helmet of Fate, who without a wearer is just a measly old artifact with one of the world's most powerful sorcerers trapped inside. Allowing himself to get ensnared by the helmet, linking John and Naboo's minds, John trapped Naboo in the auditorium of Anubis. He fairly challenges Naboo to prove that he has actually ever cared about anyone other than himself in front of the ancient Egyptian god. If Naboo wins, then Constantine dies and Naboo is free to do what he does. Despite his great deeds though, he can't actually prove that he cares about anyone. When Constantine summoned the helmet, it immediately started influencing people to come and claim the helmet and save Naboo. But Constantine had set up a man to subdue each person that was called by the helmet, and when one person didn't make it, another would be called, and then another, and another, and so on. Each person just being used as a tool by Naboo, who didn't care what happened to any of them. He proves that Naboo doesn't give a damn, and then Naboo is eaten by Anubis, just straight up eaten. Now it turns out, even the challenge was a trick, with Constantine making a deal with the demon Ifrit, who now inhabits the Helmet of Fate in the place of, and sort of alongside, Naboo, bargaining with those who choose to wear the helmet from this point forward. Number 10, Civil War II. Captain Marvel and Iron Man used to be super close, but then Civil War II happened, and BAM! We are well past the events of Civil War II now, especially regarding relationships being mended, but boy, did this initially muck up the friendship between Carol Danvers and Tony Stark. Although more recently, Tony actually just tallied votes from Legacy Avengers members and actually elected Carol the new leader of the team. Healing! After the success of Civil War 1, Marvel thought a second Civil War was in order, but this time the motives behind it weren't quite as solid as the first time around. Carol Danvers believed the inhuman Ulysses' visions of potential futures should be acted on to protect humanity. In other words, Civil War 2 was basically Minority Report. Being down this road before, Iron Man tried to talk Carol out of this madness, but after Rhodey died when a prediction of Ulysses' actually came true, there was no stopping her. Ultimately, the event led to a one-on-one -on -one fight between Carol and Tony, with Tony being seemingly permanently defeated. Although this is Iron Man, of course, so of course he would recover. We can't we can't have Marvel without Iron Man, so he has to come back. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like. Number 9. Hulk blames Tony Stark for his creation. This fight comes to us from Original Sin. Original Sin was an event where dark truths from many different characters pasts were unearthed. In Bruce Banner's case, this involved him learning that Tony Stark was the one who basically caused the accident that turned him into the Hulk. Once he knows, Hulk becomes driven to end Iron Man, and while Tony tries to escape and defeat the Hulk, he ultimately fails. In the end, Hulk comes out on top, but despite Tony being badly beaten along the way, the two old friends were able to resolve their past conflict with Hulk's Bruce Banner realizing that what Tony did years ago, nerfing his gamma explosive, wasn't really that bad in reality. I mean, if not for Stark doing that, Banner probably wouldn't have even survived the explosion and wouldn't even have been alive today. That being said, if he had perished, he also wouldn't be the Hulk, which he kind of is like, I don't even know, should I even be here? But while he regrets his transformation, Tony berates him saying that the world does need the Hulk and that his being around is not inherently bad. That Banner and Hulk are needed and wanted in the world. Honestly, while the fights are epic, the resolution is also quite like epically touching here. I gotta say. I love the end of that when they just sit down and they're just having their little talk. Talk it out guys. Sometimes you gotta 
Hulk smash it out, sometimes you gotta Hulk talk it out. Number eight, Carnage cracks Iron Man. I feel like one of the worst things you can do in a fight with Carnage is bring a symbiote into the fight with you. Bad idea. And yet this is exactly what Tony Stark decided to do in Extreme Carnage, Alpha, and Omega. He decided to get involved in all things symbiote when Null attacked Earth, infecting one of the symbiote dragons with Extremis to create the Extremiote. But bringing this new organic suit into a fight with Carnage <laughs> was kind of a bad idea as Carnage took over the Extremiote, leaving Tony completely vulnerable as he was of course naked under Underneath. Well, he was beaten here by Carnage and ended up in the hospital to recover. Fortunately, Agent Anti Venom was around to ultimately save him from Carnage's wrath and help avoid any worse damage to Stark. So. Thank goodness, but he still got his butt whooped. Number seven, Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel event, Ra's al Ghul manages to use Batman's own intel and files on the Justice League to defeat them. Raish gains access to Batman's systems and is able to retrieve these detailed files and plans via his daughter, Talia. He uses this information to take on and defeat all members of the Justice League, even managing to seemingly distract Batman by robbing the graves of his parents. Number six, Death of the Justice League. The Death of the Justice League kicked off in issue number 75 of the 2018 Justice League series. What happened to the Justice League here? Well, they faced off against Pariah, who himself is from one of the first worlds to be targeted during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Pariah was cursed with basically watching all these worlds die again and again, unable to stop it, despite being one of the first people to warn everyone that Crisis on Infinite Earths was coming. Now, with the multiverse reset following the events of Death Metal, Pariah claimed that he saw the signs of Crisis on Infinite Earths happening again. Desperate to prevent this, his plan was to wipe the slate clean when it comes to the heroes so that the possibly new anti-monitor who will come into existence will have no reason to continue with the crisis. That was his thinking anyways. Seems like some flawed logic to me, but this man has also seen some terrible things in his time. So I understand his desperation to do whatever he thinks will work when it comes to avoiding another crisis. Along with most of the rest of the league, Batman was believed to have perished in the fight against Pariah. Of course, we later learned this wasn't exactly what had really happened. Not quite what we thought, as usually when people perish in comics. We're like, they're gone? And no, they're back. Number five, failed Barbara Gordon. One of the hardest failings for Batman was when Barbara Gordon and her father, Commissioner Gordon, were successfully targeted by the Joker. Caught unaware, Babs found herself shot through the spine and paralyzed as a result of this attack. She was attacked and tormented by the Joker, who took pictures of her in pain and in states of undress for the purpose of making her father go insane. This all happened in Killing Joke, and though not all of the events of that story were made canon, Babs' pain and becoming paralyzed were. Batman has always felt awful for what happened to Barbara and has never blamed her and if anything, he feels more guilty for the fact that he wasn't there and wasn't able to protect her more. Number four, defeated by the Joker. Jason Todd was lost to Batman years ago when he was defeated by the Joker. Really both Jason Todd and Batman were defeated by him as the loss of Jason would haunt Batman for years afterwards. Jason Todd was one of those characters you expected to stay dead to. For for years, his death was considered one of the few permanent and unyielding ones in comics, kind of like Uncle Ben, who has always pretty much stayed dead. We never expected to see him return, and yet more than 20 years later, he did just that. The return of Jason would be another rough moment in Batman's life, as when Jason returned, he was drastically and forever changed. Losing Jason had already been one of the hardest moments of Batman's life, after all. His coming back, unfortunately, didn't make the loss Batman had suffered years earlier with his defeat to the Joker any less painful, unfortunately. Number three, Final Crisis, which actually apparently wasn't so final as Dark Crisis did end up following after its events. But regardless of whether or not it was actually final, Final Crisis was definitely a bad time for Earth. In this story, Darkseid actually succeeds in obtaining and releasing the anti-life equation on Earth. He puts it on the internet where it can be easily seen and then spread. Those who see it basically lose their will to live, becoming enslaved to Darkseid and his will instead of having their own will. While in the end, the hero do manage to break free from the influence of Darkseid and the anti-life equation, with Batman himself defeating Darkseid in the end with a Radeon bullet, Darkseid still works to enslave all of Earth and many of its heroes, for a time being seen as the victor. And even when Batman does succeed in 
beating Darkseid, he himself is believed killed as a result. However, in reality, he was kind of just like thrown way back through time and went to essentially have time traveling adventures until he finally made his way back to the main continuity universe. But hey, we didn't know that at the time. We had to wait to find that out. Number two, death of Damian Wayne. Batman has lost a lot of Robins over the years and a lot of adopted sons, but Damian Wayne was his natural heir. Well, natural-ish. As natural as it gets till we get a Helena Wayne in the main continuity, if that ever happens again, a girl can dream at least. Damien was the son of Bruce Wayne and Talia al Ghul. He was raised by Talia in the League of Assassins, without Batman even knowing of his existence. Until years later, when Talia dropped him off on Bruce's doorstep, declaring Damien his son. Initially, the two did not get along very well. Damien was stubborn in his ways and insisted on killing, as he'd been trained his whole life to do, because the League of Assassins, but eventually he came around and began to see the value in his father's approach to fighting crime, respecting it and even admiring it. Just as their relationship began to evolve into something more resembling a true father-son connection built on respect and trust and all that good stuff, Damien was killed by the heretic, a death that Batman can't even bring himself to avenge when he realizes that the heretic is Damien's clone. Following Damien's death, we also got volume two of Batman's issue number 18, an issue that focuses on the morning of Damien's past and is completely wordless throughout its sorrow-filled pages. Of course, Damian Wayne would also return, but you know, at the time. At the time, it was brutal. Number one, death of Alfred. What could possibly be a greater defeat than the loss of Batman's parents, Batman's son? How about the loss of his confidant, his butler, and more importantly, his lifelong father figure, Alfred? I don't think it gets much more brutal than this. While the death of Batman's parents is tragic, Alfred was there to help pick up the pieces and in essence, help to raise the boy before his parents passed and of course thereafter. He was probably one of the closest people to Batman and was more apparent to Bruce in the end than his parents were able to be due to them being lost to him when he was so young. Alfred was shockingly, shockingly killed by Bane after he kidnapped him when Damian Wayne didn't take Bane's threat seriously and set out to save Alfred. Bad idea, Damien. It was because of his pursuit of Bane that Alfred was killed by the villain, and this was all part of Bane's plan to break Batman again, but this time focusing more on breaking him mentally and psychologically than, you know, physically. Number 10 deceased Batman. In the deceased universe, the world is infected with an anti-life virus that infects people and turns them into zombies when they look at a screen. This story is apocalyptic in nature, so naturally there are a lot of brutal moments of heroes being killed by the zombie hordes. Probably the most devastating of them is what happens to the Bat family. Nightwing and Tim Drake are infected by the virus and go to Wayne Manor and attack Batman and Alfred. They bite the Dark Knight, infecting him. Alfred is forced to put down Dick and Tim with a shotgun, and Batman tries to slow the infection by getting into one of Mr. Freeze's cryo suits. He puts together a package for Damien containing a bat suit for him and turns. Alfred is forced to put him down with a shotgun and leaves the cave, thinking about how he had to put an end to three of his children. To make things even worse, in a later story in this universe, it is discovered that there is actually a cure for the virus, and Alfred has to grapple with the fact that he killed his sons when they could have been saved. Number 9. Old Man Logan On Earth 807,128, where the Old Man Logan story takes place, Captain America's old foe, the Red Skull, managed to organize all of the Earth's supervillains and used them to defeat all of the heroes of their world and take over the United States. As he explained to a dying Captain America, Abomination was given California, although a crazed Hulk gang would eventually take this over. Doctor Doom was given the Bible Belt, and Magneto was given Las Vegas, although this was eventually taken over by the Kingpin. Red Skull took over the White House and installed himself as Dictator. Worst of all was how the villains defeated the X-Men. Wolverine was monitoring the situation with Jubilee when the X-Mansion was suddenly attacked by supervillains. As the children fled, Wolverine made a brave final stand against the bad guys, cutting them down one at a time until there were none left. It was then that Mysterio revealed that the whole thing had been a 
an illusion. And Logan had been attacking his own teammates the entire time. This was so devastating that Logan walked away from the situation due to his guilt, letting the villains take over and vowing to never pop his claws again. Number 8. Injustice Superman One of the most devastating defeats that we've ever seen is the one that broke Superman's spirit and turned him from a hero into a villain. In the world featured in the Injustice games and comics, the Joker has become bored with dealing with Batman and decides to try his luck going up against the Man of Steel. Joker brainwashed Superman into destroying Metropolis as well as Lois Lane and his unborn child. This caused Superman to snap and set aside all the morality that he was known for, and he brutally killed the Joker. This began a chain reaction of events that led to Superman deciding to punish all of the criminals and reshape the world in his image, becoming more unhinged and violent the more power he seized, eventually becoming a full-on dictator, who Batman was forced to fight with an insurgency. The Joker may not have survived his encounter with Superman, but the fact that he was able to make him destroy everything he loved, break his moral code, and turn into the very thing he was fighting against, plunging the world into a horrifying dystopia, makes this a pretty good win for the Clown Prince of Crime. This Old Man Logan and the deceased entry would normally rank higher, but as none of these events are canon to the main universe, I've decided to keep them at the bottom of the list so we can focus on defeats that actually happened. And it's Evan Thanos. Remember what Mysterio said, now that is an Avengers level threat. Well luckily he didn't say that on Earth 57780, because on that Earth, home of the Super Spidey Stories number 39 from 1979, because in those pages, against the efforts of Hellcat and Spider-Man to thwart him, Thanos attempted to seize the Cosmic Cube. However, Hellcat intervened by kicking the cube out of Thanos' grasp, inadvertently sending it into an adjacent alley where a young child stumbled upon it. Despite Thanos' persistent attempts to reclaim it though, the two heroes successfully prevented his retrieval. Consequently, uh, it comes as no surprise that a number of heroes have risen to oppose him. However, his most humiliating setback occurred when, in these pages, he was apprehended by the NYPD. That's Right, the New York Police Department captured Thanos. This particular incident may have also attributed to the fact that Thanos was brazenly flying around New York City with a helicopter emblazoned with his name, so we kinda, you know, knew that he was there, virtually just like inviting arrest. But still, Thanos was arrested and lost that way. What the hell? And it's six, Darkseid. Bruce Wayne was not taken seriously by Darkseid. As a matter of fact, Batman uses the element of being underestimated to his greatest advantage. Batman does not kill, but he was forced to do so when Darkseid threatened Earth. The only known substance that can kill a new god is Radeon. So, Batman shot Darkseid with a Radeon bullet and himself died in the process. Darkseid, for that matter, had Batman as the last person in mind that could stop him, um, cause he thought if anybody would, it would be Clark. So, yeah. Up until this point, the only human or sentient being, for that matter, that had truly made Darkseid, the god of evil of the DC Universe, cowering and running away, uh, in fear is Batman. So, yeah, there you go. Batman killed Darkseid by shooting him. Halfway through, in the number five, Squirrel Girl versus Galactus. Okay, I know y'all love Squirrel Girl, but come on. I like, I get that there's a whole series called The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, but this deserves to be on the list. This is a little much. The solo series debuted in January of 2015 and ran for eight issues, but then was relaunched in October of that same year as part of Marvel's all new, all different branding, and was continued to be published until November of 2019 with 50 issues, for a total of 58. Both series were written by Ryan North, but in issue number 4 of volume 1, Squirrel Girl literally stops Galactus from coming to Earth by being friends with him. Come on, okay? You can't sit there typing telling me that this doesn't make this deserving of that list, okay? Like, she didn't even have to fight him, for God's sakes. Okay, that's stupid. You're just gonna talk the devourer of worlds into not devouring a world? What? No, that's not how that works. The waiter at Olive Garden can't stop me from shoving more bread down my throat, so how could you stop someone who's literally eating planets? And like, I get that you all love Squirrel Girl, but come on. I know that suggesting anything is gonna make people mad at me, but still, Squirrel Girl beating Galactus, no. Okay, no. It's it's nuts. In it for Justice League. 
The, the Justice Buster bat suit is a mech suit that's part of Batman's Fenrir contingency, which is a suit designed to take down the entirety of the Justice League. Making its feature appearance in Batman Endgame, the Joker used his virus to warp the brains of the Justice League members at the beginning of the plot. Batman was then forced to use his Fenrir protocol to eliminate his teammates before it was too late. The suit was successful in eliminating Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Aquaman, but met an even match at the hands of Superman. After a lengthy fight, they were, they were trading blows, Superman tore through the armor and nearly killed Bruce, which would have been realistic. Until Bruce used an I kid you not kryptonite chewing gum to spit in Clark's face, rendering him unconscious. Come on. Okay, like imagine waking up to learn that you passed out because Batman spit in your face. Like seriously, dude, please. Like, I get that we're post-COVID, but like this wasn't post-COVID, okay? He literally kept a piece of chewing gum in his mask. He says that he keeps it in the helmet so that he can chew it and then spit it like Clark. Dude, like, I, okay, sure, you had miniaturized red suns on your knuckles, you had Greek supernatural weaponry, you had super fast servers and electromagnetic nerve trees for Flash, but chewing gum? Chewing gum is the thing that takes Superman down? That's like freaking, that's like Green Lantern being taken down by a number two pencil. Getting close to the end, in at number three, Cobalt Blue. While in the comics, Malcolm Thon is the long lost twin brother of Barry Allen, he is also Cobalt Blue, one of a number of evil speedsters of the Flash that wielded the blue flame. In the Arrowverse, however, Cobalt Blue is Eddie Thon, who is brought back to life by the negative speed force in order to make him their avatar. Uh, spoiler alerts for the series finale of The Flash, by the way. Okay, you've had enough time. To erase the reverse Flash from the timeline, Eddie shoots himself in the heart as he is a direct ancestor of the speedster. His death created a paradox since Eddie did not leave behind any children to continue the Thon name. So, Eobard, aka the reverse Flash, is never born. The paradox, though, also caused a wormhole to open up and start expanding, pulling Eddie's body into it. Then, in the final season, it is later revealed that Eddie was resurrected by the negative speed force in 2049 to become its new avatar. He originally worked as a scientist at Mercury Labs known as Malcolm Gilmore until he was struck by a red lightning bolt from the negative speed force mimicking Barry's origin story. However, the way his storyline ends, again, Flash season finale spoilers, is by Barry convincing him to let go of the hate and remaining the negative speed force avatar. They also have a climactic battle with all of the past speedster villains that lasts like two minutes and then they all disappear. So yeah, Barry literally beats the negative speed force talking to, to, to Eddie. God. <laughs> Oh, I love The Flash, but come on, jeez. Penultimately, in at number two, Musical. And no, this isn't about Music Meister, because within the pages of Final Crisis, utilizing her legendary lasso of truth, Wonder Woman releases Darkseid's consciousness from Turpin's body, and despite being physically defeated, Darkseid's dying essence continues to drag the entirety of reality towards annihilation. Time and space crumble as the catastrophic effects intensify until only Superman remains. Engulfed in darkness at the culmination of existence, he struggles to replicate a machine known as the Miracle Machine, an apparatus that's capable of granting wishes which had been revealed to him by Brainiac 5 during his journey to the future. Darkseid's essence resurfaces, coveting the machine, but Superman ultimately obliterates him by employing his last reserves of superpowered breath to emit a harmonious song, countering the vibrational frequency of Darkseid's life force ensuring his ultimate demise. Yeah, Superman sang Dark Side to death, and if that's not stupid, I don't know what is. And finally, in number one, Batman versus Hulk. Talk about one-sided fights, right? Okay, like Batman standing up to Superman is one thing. They're within the same universe. He can get kryptonite, he's rich, I get it. Shockingly enough, Batman seemingly achieved the impossible feat of defeating the Hulk as well in the days of 1981 when DC and Marvel were still on friendly terms, and the concept of separate universes hadn't really established yet. They occasionally collaborated on crossover stories, such as what unfolded in DC Special Series number 27. Written by the late Len Wein and illustrated by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, in this extraordinary encounter, Batman unexpectedly crosses paths with a rampaging Hulk, who had been manipulated by the Joker to see Batman as an adversary. So the Hulk 
saw Batman and, you know, kind of got mad and attacked him because, you know, adversary. So, Batman, recognizing his immense power, somehow evaded every single one of Hulk's blows because even one of them would kill him instantly. And then, somehow, with calculated precision, he drops a pellet of knockout gas, which disoriented Hulk, and then, somehow, Batman kicked the Hulk in the stomach, which made him inhale the gas that then knocked him out. So yeah, that's right. Batman kicked the Hulk in the gut and actually made him flinch so bad he had to inhale, inhaling gas that passed, that made him pass out. Yeah, that's also pretty damn stupid, but I'm not sure. Number 10, all of this is prologue. Maybe one of the most powerful losses that I felt in recent history while reading comics came from the event AXE, Judgment Day. Not only is there the initial illusionary loss that our heroes feel, where I actually for a moment thought that they had all been killed by going for the Celestial's off switch, only to find out that this was basically a ruse created by the progenitor, but when they actually all physically united to go up against the progenitor in real life and it wasn't an illusion, they failed as well. This all went down in AXE Judgment Day issue number 5, where many were killed as a result of the plan to attack the Celestial altogether and directly head on. Only a few eggs from Krakoa were able to be saved, and so bringing back some of the many who had fallen was a tough choice. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about resurrection protocols which are happening on Krakoa, which is the mutant island right now. It left me wondering as well where this story could possibly go next. And I mean, this story was like a roller coaster. It was actually, I really liked Judgment Day. It was, it was a whirlwind. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love when we talk about brutal, brutal moments, be sure to check out our brutal playlist for even more brutality. Number nine delicious. Maybe one of the most gruesome fights to have ever happened involving Spider-Man happens against one of my personal favorite villains, Morlin. And yes, I know, there are many people out there that don't like Morlin, but I do like Morlin. What can I say? I am a sucker for vampires, even if they are weird, multiversal energy vampires that feed on animalistic totemic energy. During the other story, Spider-Man was suffering from a mysterious illness and was weakened. It was during this time that Morlin struck in issue 526 of The Amazing Spider-Man. Not only does he beat Spider-Man to a pulp here, but he also devours one of his eyeballs, plucking it out. Yeah, ouch. And also, if I may add, Ew. I also love that for this point, I literally took the quote, delicious. Number eight, be true to yourself. Be the best you are able to. Don't ever give anything but your best. This defeat wasn't a straight up defeat per se, but really a lot of that column A with just a hint of column B. During the Crisis on Infinite Earths event in issue number seven of the event's miniseries, Kara attempts to rescue her cousin Superman from the clutches of the Anti-Monitor. As the Anti-Monitor stands poised to kill him, Kara comes out swinging. Here, Supergirl proved just how fierce she can be and how determined when it came to protecting others. Ultimately, she was defeated and even killed in this fearsome fight, but at least she did succeed in destroying Anti-Monitor's machines here, and with the help of Dr. Light saving Cal. Supergirl sacrificed her life to save her cousin, but her death also served to remind him of his own mortality. Number seven, Shazam in Injustice. In the Injustice game, Superman is the tyrant ruler of the Earth. Most of the other heroes have either joined him or joined back. Batman as part of an effort to thwart Superman and bring him down. One of the heroes who remained on Superman's side was actually Billy Batson, Shazam. This is surprising to pretty much everyone, but seeing that Billy Batson is only a kid, more susceptible to some manipulation, it starts to make more sense. It also makes it very, very, very brutal when Superman takes down Shazam for turning on Superman and mentioning the now dead Lois Lane. Superman takes down Billy frighteningly quick, using his frost breath to free Shazam's mouth shut, stopping him from using his signature phrase, and then melting his brain through his eyes with his heat vision. Now, I don't know if this would actually work in any other continuity. I don't see why not, but Shazam has proven himself more than capable to take on Superman. Either way, it made me immediately hate this version of Superman, and it made me pretty darn sad at the same time. Number six, Ultimate Spider-Man. Ultimate Spider-Man is one of the most beloved Spider-Man runs 
ever. Which made the death of Spider-Man such a hard comic to read. Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, escapes the Triskelon along with Dr. Octopus, Sandman, Kraven the Hunter, Electro, and Vulture, and hides in an apartment building near Central Park. With S.H.I.E.L.D. occupied by an explosion, Osborn tells the six sinister villains that it's the perfect time to do God's work and finally take out Spider-Man. Now Otto objects to this plan, but Norman overpowers Otto and deals a fatal blow to him. Learning this, Peter heads to where the battle took place to find Otto's body. He goes off to investigate where Norman was off said to be, but when he leaves, he ends up spotting Captain America standing over a beaten Nick Fury and sees the Punisher aiming a rifle at Cap. That's all part of a separate issue, but he immediately dives towards Cap and pushes him out of the way, taking the bullet on himself. Now while it wasn't fatal, in his weakened state he had a much harder time facing off against Green Goblin and his collected villains. Peter puts up one hell of a heroic fight with the help of Aunt May, the Human Torch, and Mary Jane, taking up pretty much everyone until he faces this super amped up version of Green Goblin. Fighting on his last legs, he's helped out by Mary Jane, who shares one last kiss with Peter before he defeats the Goblin and then suffers his final blow from an explosion. He then passes away in the arms of Mary Jane in a pretty iconic panel, and now I want to cry. So that's great. Number 5. Countdown to Infinite Crisis I think we can all agree that it's incredibly rare to see a mainline superhero taken out of the picture. And if it does happen, it's usually in a huge blaze of glory like Spider-Man up there, or an incredibly tragic moment. Or after a long momentous battle with cancer in the case of Marvel's Marvel. So when Ted Kord, Blue Beetle, was erased from existence thanks to a bullet from my barrel at the hands of Maxwell Lord in the Countdown to Infinite Crisis, it was pretty bad. After following Ted the whole book as he struggles for anyone in the Justice League to take him seriously, while he's correctly on the trail of Maxwell Lord and learning of all his misuse of both the Justice League's files, Batman's Brother's Eye satellite, and the Omax, you'd expect Kord to come out surviving, having a cathartic moment where he finally gets the League's respect or to make a dent in Lord's plans, but instead, he gets snuffed out like a tea light candle that hadn't even begun to make the wax melt. It's abrupt, it's brutal, and it made me legitimately sad to read it. Number 4. House of M Look, there is getting completely clobbered, losing life or loved ones, going down the path of a tyrant, and turning on one another, and that all happens in House of M. The kicking off point for this story was a defeat all of its own. The heroes being completely helpless as the Scarlet Witch completely rewrote reality. Now while she gave everyone pretty much exactly what they all wanted and made mutants the dominant race on the earth, she robbed the world of their free will and had them all living a complete lie. And when that lie was uncovered, the Scarlet Witch lost more than she already had. Blaming that loss on her inclusion as a mutant, she spoke the three little words of no more mutants, and all at once, the mutant species suffered one of its most devastating defeats. All at once, 986,618 mutants were depowered, leaving some in situations that saw them lose their lives, thanks to the decimation. It was first estimated that 91.4% of the world's mutant population lost their powers overnight, leaving less than 200 mutants in the world. The Xavier Institute's mutant students count went down from 182 to just 27. This left mutants on the brink of complete extinction. Number 3. Hush Batman has a bit of a habit for being infallible. Or at least I think that's what he likes to tell himself. So when someone gets the better of him, it hurts. But when that someone is a childhood best friend, I can imagine it hurts quite a bit more. In the 2003 story Batman Hush, Bruce Wayne's childhood friend, Dr. Tommy Elliot, comes back to Gotham. But unbeknownst to Bruce, Tommy has a plan in place. Working with the Riddler and a large array of Batman's rogues gallery, including Killer Croc, Clayface, Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and even the Joker, Tommy orchestrates a huge plan manipulating events and those closest to Bruce Wayne to leave Batman distracted, outsmarted, paranoid, and ultimately subdued. He uses intimate details of Bruce's life against him in an attempt to take down Batman and have him unmasked at Arkham Asylum, all in some weird attempt for revenge against Bruce's father and a promise made by baby Bruce. Now if it wasn't for the intervention of Jim Gordon and a reformed Two-Face, Batman would have completely lost being broken down over the course of the story by his old friend. Number 2. Pain of the Gods If we are talking devastating defeats, 
a really good place to look would be issues 101 to 106 of JLA from 2004, a storyline titled Pain of the Gods that details each member of the Justice League's biggest failures. It is absolutely depressing, but on the bright side, perfect for this list. Huh. It kicks off with Superman, who arrives to save people trapped in a burning building. Now an unnamed hero shows up to lend a hand while Superman saves those inside, and he brings them to safety until an explosion goes off, burning the other superhero to a crisp. The second issue follows Flash as he fails to save two younger people from a burning building, finding them when it was too late and the smoke inhalation had got them. He then goes around the city installing fire detectors in every single house, getting mad at a family who didn't find time to go install a new battery. In issue 3, we see Jon Stewart, Green Lantern, trapped between two separate domestics. He rushes to one and prevents it, but when he makes it to the other, it was arguably worse and resulted in a loss of life. The next issue follows Martian Manhunter, but this time it's more of his failings to understand the emotion that we experience as humans, and his alienation from that, and the pain of losing his entire species. It's really interesting, honestly, but moving on to issue 105, this one follows Wonder Woman and for the Amazon, it was an extremely close near-death experience at the hands of a new supervillain that drove her down a path of needing some emotional support. Now, each issue ends with the team coming together for each other as a support system, and it's actually really sweet. And it all wraps up in the final issue with a story that was happening alongside everything else I talked about, but I'll leave that for you to read for yourself because it's really cool and I think you'll like it. And finally, in at number one, it's Nightfall. There are many deranged and off the wall villains in Batman's rogues gallery, and while the Dark Knight has suffered losses and defeats at the hands of a few, none of those defeats are as infamous as the one he suffered at the hands of Bane. By issue 11 of the Broken Bat part of the arc, Bane had managed to find out that Bruce Wayne was indeed Batman. Bane surprised Bruce at his home, pumped himself with venom, and laid a brutal beatdown on the Dark Knight in his own home. The fight continued on into the Batcave, and being completely taken by surprise, Batman is on his last legs when the venom-fueled tank of a man lifted Batman over his head and dropped him spine first onto his massive back-breaking knee. This brutal move captured in one of the most iconic panels ever put the Batman completely out of commission, requiring him to choose another to fill his role as the protector of Gotham until he could make his final triumphant return. Kicking off the list at number 10 is Civil War. While there was a clear winner in terms of who won the conflict in Marvel Comics Civil War event, that being Tony Stark, in the grand scheme of things, there really wasn't any winner. The Civil War split the entire superhuman community down the middle. Heroes allied with villains, friends turned on friends, people were manipulated into joining a side, and a few of those people passed away, all for an act that would require the registration and regulation of superhuman individuals following a completely avoidable superhuman cause catastrophe. And while you had Tony Stark coming out on top, Top, he made a lot of enemies along the way, including Spider-Man, and I don't think he ever intended for the death of Steve Rogers. Also, after he came out on top, he was put in charge of S.H.I.E.L.D. and did a spectacularly bad job, leading to Norman Osborn, of all people, to take over, ushering in a whole lot more of bad. I don't think really anyone came away from Civil War feeling particularly great. Number 9, The Reigning. After the passing of Odin at the hands of Surtur during Dan Jurgen's Thor run for from 1998 to 2004, Thor became the new Allfather of Asgard, and he made some pretty interesting choices during this time. One of the biggest decisions he made was moving Asgard to the skies above New York to inspire mortals with its grandeur and to force the world to be better. This triggers a conflict with the governments of Earth, which ultimately ends with the Asgardians conquering the planet and completely wiping out most of the superheroes. The story now shifts 200 years, where Thor now rules over this dystopian future and is no longer worthy of Mjolnir after killing his human counterpart Jake Olsen, symbolically cutting his ties with humanity. There is no more famine or disease, no borders or religion, there is no need to work, and Asgard's magic provides infinite clean energy for the whole planet. But this comes at the cost of making humans become inferior with a few 
Rescue while also planning to rise up against the Asgardians in order to regain their freedom. Thor marries Amor the Enchantress and they have a son called Magni. Now Magni ends up supporting the humans and the rebellion after seeing how badly the Asgardians are actually treating them. He challenges his father to lift up Mjolnir, proving that he is no longer worthy and leading Thor to question his own actions. After seeing the error of his ways, Thor uses the Odin Force to go back in time, erasing that whole timeline and making sure the Asgardians never take over Earth. For a character as unstoppable as Thor, his defeat here came in a much more poetic way and it made for a great story. If you're enjoying this part two, make sure you get yourself over to our channel to check out part one and maybe, if you want to, subscribe while you're at it. Always helps us out here at Top Ten Nerd. Coming in at number eight is Avengers Infinity War. In the MCU, most of the movies follow a simple idea of a hero facing and eventually defeating a villain, coming out triumphant by the end of the film, completing an arc. Even if the villain survives to continue into another film in the cinematic universe, they are still usually defeated by the hero at the end of their debut movie. Well, when we were given the Avengers Infinity War, it marked the first time in the MCU when the heroes, and furthermore, all the heroes together officially lost by the end of the movie. Despite their best efforts to stop Thanos from acquiring all the Infinity Stones to complete his mission, he still managed to put them all into his big golden gauntlet and snap out half of the life in the universe. He left the heroes in shock of what even just happened as they watched their friends turn to dust. And when we meet them all again in the next film, Avengers Endgame, they've all been left reeling and trying to move forward from such a massive defeat, which led to one of their greatest victories. Number 7. Loses his marriage Possibly one of the worst defeats is also not even a physical one. At one point, Mephisto ends up tricking Peter into giving his marriage away. Well, not really tricking him, and not really Peter alone, as Mary Jane was also one of the two to make this call, but it was still pretty brutal. Not just for Peter, but also for all of us readers. After Peter's secret identity was revealed, a hit was put out on him, but when they missed, they actually hit Aunt May instead, who ended up in critical care and was on the verge of dying. In a bid to save her life, Mary Jane and Peter traded away their marriage to Mephisto, having no choice but to do so if they wanted to keep Aunt May alive. And of course, we can't let Aunt May die, I mean, she's lived for so long, keep her alive. Number 6. Losing his hand and his wife This defeat comes to us from the very brutal pages of J.J. Abrams and his son Henry Abrams' Spider-Man comic from 2019. In issue number 1, we immediately start off with Spider-Man fighting against a big villain and his army of semi-organic robot specimens. We later learn that this villain's name is Cadaverous. Almost instantly, Peter's life is changed forever when we see him emerge from the rubble with a badly damaged arm, with a hand that looks like it's barely still attached to be honest. Black and blue from the fight. Mary Jane rushes over to him, encouraging Peter to run. But before either of them do, the battle finds them again and Mary Jane is insta-killed when she is impaled by one of Cadaverous's impossibly long claws. Or fingers. Claw fingers. Welcome to 2019's Spider-Man. Number 5. Losing His Daughter One of the most heart-wrenching moments in Spider-Man comics for me comes from a very personal moment for both Peter and Mary Jane. This is like a brutal defeat that isn't even like a fight, like a fist fight. At one point, Mary Jane was pregnant and even seemingly gave birth to a baby girl. However, Mary Jane was wrongfully told that the little one did not make it, when in reality, Pete and MJ's daughter was actually taken by Allison Mongrain, who was later revealed to be working for Norman Osborn. What Norman wanted with the child? Well, we'll never really know, as this was never really revealed to us fans. The only thing that was seemingly confirmed was their daughter's tragic fate, much later on. That is, if we can even believe what Norman says to be true, I personally wouldn't at this point, so I'm still personally hopeful that Peter and Mary Jane's lost daughter could still return one day. Although I don't know how that would work if their marriage no longer existed. Would that affect them having a kid together? Could they have never had a kid together? Does that get erased? Number 4. Got Your Eye Morlin actually is the one to feast on Peter's eye. This happens during the story Spider-Man the Other. In this story, Peter finds out he's dying and sets out to try and find a cure. However, not even the greatest scientific minds in the world, including Black Panther and Mr. Fantastic, can find one. He even tries to travel back in time, but that ends up not working out very well either. Morlin at this time was popping up just to say some cryptic stuff to Peter, like, be careful what you wish for, particularly when you don't truly want it. But eventually, the cat is out of the bag, and so Morlin reveals himself and decides to stop speaking cryptically and start kicking butt, which is just what he does. He not only beats up Spider-Man until he can no longer move and lays helpless in the middle of the street, basically a bloody pulp, but he also eats his eyeball. Yes, 
actually. Don't worry though, Peter would grow it back. This is comics after all. Number 3. Meeting his end Spider-Man actually died in the comics at one point, and not even when he was inside his own body. This happened when he and Otto Octavius, also known as the villain Dr. Octopus, changed bodies. Body swap! Peter did so unwillingly and ended up being tricked by Doc Ock into doing so. Otto hoped to prolong his life and thwart death by taking Peter's younger body for himself while his older body, failing, would eventually shut down. Surprisingly, Otto's plan actually succeeded. However, before Peter and Otto's body died, he managed to at least convince Otto to carry on as the hero Spider-Man in his stead. So although he lost kinda overall here, he won that small victory at least, so it's something. Number 2. Infected Something you can't really beat, at least not when it comes to the Marvel Zombies universe, is being infected. In Marvel Zombies, Spider-Man is one of the earliest heroes to be taken over by the zombie virus. This ends tragically for him as the hunger takes hold of him. He actually hurts those who he fought so, so hard and so long over the years to protect Mary Jane and Aunt May, devouring them whole. He does his best to resist but unfortunately he is completely unable to and even ends up being one of the zombies who actually lives the longest in this series. So he has to sit with this knowledge for quite some time, which I imagine would really suck. Number 1. Death of Gwen Stacy I think one of the worst defeats that Spider-Man has ever suffered, one of his worst losses, especially in his own mind, is the death of Gwen Stacy. Losing her was one of his biggest failings. This one went down during a fight with the Green Goblin, widely considered to be Spider-Man's main nemesis. As they fought, the Green Goblin used Gwen Stacy kind of as bait. At one point, he tosses her from the top of either the George Washington Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on which version of the story we're talking about here. The original one, it was the George Washington Bridge, I believe. While Spider-Man attempts to stop her fall by catching her with his webbing, it's believed that it was actually the whiplash as a result of Spider-Man's move that resulted in her death, causing her neck to snap. We get that terrible snap sound effect. However, Green Goblin has stated before that it was actually the fall that killed Gwen, and that she was actually dead from the shock even before Spider-Man's webbing had touched her. Either way, Spider-Man still blames himself for her loss, even to this day. And to be fair, I mean, editors have confirmed that, yeah, Spider-Man kind of did that. But either way, she would have died, so it's not really his fault, because she's going to hit the ground, she's going to die, or you're going to catch her, she's going to die. So, death all around. Number 10. Defeated by the Green Goblin Probably one of the most brutal defeats I can think of that Spider-Man has suffered was his final, or at least final at the time, fight against the Green Goblin. In this fight, which happens in the Ultimate Comics in the Earth of 1610, Peter starts off already being run down after facing the Sinister Six. To finish it off, he also must face Green Goblin, who in this reality is a hulking beast, not just a deranged and evil man on a glider in a mask. Just when it seems like Peter is about to be defeated, even being unmasked at this point throughout Throughout the course of the fight, Mary Jane shows up to help, running into Green Goblin with a giant truck. Thanks, Mary Jane. However, this wouldn't be enough, and while Green Goblin would also seemingly perish in the end, so would Peter. Of course, both Green Goblin and Peter Parker would later return, but for Spider Man, this return wouldn't happen for some time. And even when he did at first reveal himself to actually be alive, he chose to pass his mantle on to the new Spider Man of the Ultimate Comics and Earth 1610, Miles Morales. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list. If you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9. The Dimension of Spots Oddly enough, one of the people who has been shown as powerful enough to defeat Spider-Man was actually the Spot, who most probably think of as more of like a goofy villain, and yeah, most times he kinda is. But during their first fight, he actually proved himself to be pretty powerful, even finding a way to get around Spider-Man's spider sense. This all went down in issue number 99 of The Spectacular Spider-Man, which was also when they had their first fight against one another. Spider-Man ended up being completely surrounded by spots, well, spots, and from the spot dimension, the spot punched and kicked the hero to the point that Peter found it hard to focus on his spider sense and detect where the danger was coming from to dodge it in time as it was kind of coming well, from all around him. The Spot also discombobulated Spider-Man by taking him into the Spot dimension and throwing him through another portal, another spot, which led out to a brick wall. He left Spider-Man and Black Cat with a warning to not bother the Kingpin again or risk being destroyed by the Spot. 
Number 8. Spider-Man Reign While he ultimately comes out victorious in the end, Spider-Man is temporarily defeated during Spider-Man Reign. If you aren't familiar with this story, allow me to explain. Spider-Man Reign has been described before as Marvel's version of The Dark Knight Returns for Spider-Man. In this story, Spider-Man is an elderly man who was once a florist but was recently fired. No longer a hero after years ago losing his wife, Mary Jane, and with her his motivation to be Spider-Man, the city of New York has become a police state, controlled under Mayor Waters Iron Fist. Eventually, Spider-Man is inspired once more to rise up, but at first when he does, the mayor responds by sicking his Sinner Six on Spider-Man. In this fight, he is joined by his old enemy, the Hypno-Hustler. However, the Hypno-Hustler is soon after defeated, leaving Spider-Man to be unmasked by Kraven, exposing New York City's hero as now an old man. At this moment, he is seemingly brutally defeated. Fortunately though, it's only a brief defeat for this older Spider-Man. Spider-Man. In at number 7, Injustice. You knew this was going to be on the list. The Superman of the Injustice universe has pretty much the same history as the baseline Superman. But when the Joker kidnaps the pregnant Lois Lane, it lures Superman into a trap of fear gas. In his poison state, Superman hallucinates his true love as the villain Doomsday and instantly attacks, flying Lois and his unborn child into space, killing them both and inadvertently causing a nuclear bomb to destroy his city, Metropolis. After suddenly losing his his city and loved ones in one go, Superman goes into an honestly understandable rage, bursting into the interrogation room where Batman is learning the true intentions of the Joker and plunges his super fist through the guy's chest. Following these events, Superman takes control of the Earth and rules it as a tyrant. Fortunately, Batman forms an insurgency to try and beat this corrupted Superman, eventually listing the aid of another Earth's Justice League and I guess it's a big hullabaloo, but Joker got a hole through his chest and that's the point. Number 6. Mad Love The Batman story Mad Love tells the story of how the Joker manipulated Harleen Quinzel into becoming his almost equally insane boo, Harley Quinn. Eventually, over the course of the story, Harley decides that she's going to try and do her bubby boo proud by capturing the Dark Knight and putting an end to his long crime fighting life. The funny thing is that Harley basically gets all the way there. Harley is meticulous over every detail and rechecks everything until Batman wakes up hanging upside down dangling over a piranha infested fish tank. This is when Batman pulls a trick out of his sleeve. First of all he reveals the Joker's manipulation tactics to Harley and that almost breaks the girl's heart. But then he essentially tells Harley that unless Joker sees the deed himself he would never believe that Harley could have done it. This gives Harley some grief and so she calls up the Joker himself and informs him of the situation. Situation. This drives Joker mental, as he can't stand the thought of his girlfriend stealing his spotlight. So much so that he basically causes her to go crashing out a window and he frees the Batman himself. In a moment of clarity, Joker realizes he could take this opportunity to take down the Batman, and I suppose he forgot that he just leveled the playing field for the Dark Knight, who quickly gets the upper hand and it leads to the Joker's defeat. This was after the Batman admits to Joker that Harley got closer to beating him than the Joker ever has, and then adds a little extra slap in the face when he calls Joker Puddin. Number 5. Red Hood If you haven't read 3 Jokers, please go do that. It's kind of treated as its own separate story apart from the DC Universe, and whether that's true or not, it's up to personal preference, but it's a really good story. But that's not important. Essentially, it's revealed that instead of there being one person over the course of history who has been the Joker, there have actually been Three, the clown, the comedian, and the criminal. Each have been seen at different times and have been involved in some of the biggest moments in Batman history. The clown is the one first caught in the story and he also happens to be the one who laid a crowbar shaped beat down on a young Jason Todd, Robin. With the help of Jason Todd and Batgirl, Batman tracks down the clown and together they subdue him. Unfortunately, Batman has to run off to help out with the second Joker, leaving the clown in the hands of Babs and Jason Todd. That may have been a mistake. The Joker wastes no time getting to his tactic of driving people up the wall, using his attack on Todd to drive Red Hood to the point of no return, and Red Hood introduces Joker to the afterlife with a well placed ball of lead through the Joker's cranium. Number 4. Joker War Joker War has probably one of the coolest Joker vs Batman fights 
ever. By taking over Wayne Enterprises and exposing Batman's connections with the GCPD, Joker leaves Bruce without access to his vast wealth. This is part of what leads to Bruce assuming his Batman identity full time as the Joker's masked goons do everything to break into his various bat caves in order to gain control of his tech and sensitive information. And the Joker is more than successful, getting a prototype futuristic bat suit and jokerizing it. He also takes the corpse of the recently passed away Alfred Pennyworth and reanimates it with Joker toxin. It's pretty messed up and the climactic fight between Joker and Batman and Ace Chemicals is equally as intense. After going through an absolute slog fest against each other, Joker actually gains the upper hand and just as he is about to do a number on Batman's face, Harley Quinn shows up out of nowhere, placing a shot right in the clown's right eye. Which didn't kill him, which is weird. She then ties up Joker alongside a little bang bang boom boom device and then straps one to herself and runs off telling Batman that he has to pick which one of them he is going to save. Joker is pretty confident that Batman will have to save him, but then Batman, pretty confidently himself, waltzes past him and runs off to save Harley, leaving the Joker to be blown to smithereens. Number 3 Paralyzed. In the lead up to Joker War that we just talked about, Joker actually pays a visit to one member of the Bat family in particular. In Batgirl number 47, Barbara gets home and is chillaxing on the couch when she begins to realize that her things are ever so slightly out of place, alerting her to someone else's presence in the room. Like a ninja, she hurls a glass into the dark, smashing it into the Joker's grinning mug. After getting in more than a few good solid hits on the Joker, the criminal turns the tables by whipping out a small remote, pressing a button and deactivating the implant in Barbara's spine that restored her ability to walk. The Joker reveals that his remote can apparently manipulate Barbara's body to move against her will. But even that doesn't phase Barbara too much. Instead, she starts to psychologically torment the Joker, using the fact that he is obsessed with the Dark Knight to manipulate him where she wants him. In a rather twisted turn of events, she ends up having the last laugh when she uses a sharp pipe to stab herself in the back, fully disabling the implant and Joker's hold on her. And then she hurdles that same pipe into the Joker's spine, seemingly paralyzing him. Number 2 Nightwing In Joker Last Laugh, Joker is locked up in the slab and was told he had a terminal brain tumor and only a limited amount of time left to live. But this was all just an attempt by those working at the penitentiary to cause the Joker to face the end of his own life and possibly come to terms with his own wrongdoings. They clearly don't understand the Joker though. Instead, the Joker decided to bring his crime to a whole other level so that he would go out in a blaze of glory. He essentially unleashed a special Joker toxin on a huge number of supervillains, turning them a bit more Joker-like. One of these villains was Killer Croc. The Bat family sprung into action, but the Robin at the time, Tim Drake, was captured by Croc, leaving only his torn costume. With the other Bat family members assuming the worst had happened to the younger crime fighter, the original Robin, Dick Grayson, Nightwing, went on the warpath. He tracked down the Joker and proceeded to lay an absolutely bloody beatdown on him, even when Tim revealed himself and tried to stop Dick. Nightwing thought it was some kind of trick and carried on his punch fest until the Joker actually passed away. Batman himself had to step in and revive the Joker with CPR, I don't know how that works, but for a moment there, Nightwing actually beat the Joker into the afterlife. And finally, in at our number one spot, he stabs himself. For our number one spot, it only makes sense to talk about Joker's very first appearance and also his very first embarrassing defeat. In Batman Numero Uno, we are introduced to the Joker for the first time. The Joker has been the perpetrator of some pretty vicious crimes across Gotham and the Batman ends up on the case. When the two first get into an altercation, the Joker actually gets the upper hand on Bruce, whacking him with a good haymaker and then a kick before pushing him off a bridge. It's not until a bit later after the Joker has caused a whole whack more on deaths and even face the Batman a few more times, even getting kicked in the face by the boy wonder himself, that the Joker makes a triumphant return. Sort of. After a whole altercation at a museum, the Joker is pursued by both Batman and his boy Wonder. In the final climactic battle, Bruce and Robin have Joker on the ropes until Joker pulls out a dagger, trying to bring the Batman down for good. Turns out, Batman is pretty quick, who'd have thought? And he sidesteps, causing the Joker to accidentally plunge the dagger into his own chest. But as we are all pretty well aware of, this wasn't his true end. In fact, it was just his beginning. 